This is propaganda live. I only suggest how to think and how to vote. An extraordinary cultural moment, already iconic, already iconic. We love you, you're welcome here. Where did this guy come from? And it's like he's been doing it for ages, he's very confident. Plainly, and this is a matter now of fact and record, I'm right wing. I feel that Christ may have had a better vision. Is this misinformation or is Vivek Ramaswamy in the lavatory? That's a sort of like a poem, is this Eminem? Man, if we can come together in that stream. I'm assuming it was just the P. Now, these are the kind of conversations I think that the legacy media can no longer compete with. Win, 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 win. This is On Brand, a podcast where we discuss the ideas and antics of one Russell Brand. I'm Al Worth, and each week I go through an episode of Brand Show with my co host, Lauren B. That's me, and I am entirely in the dark about what we are going to cover today, but we've got a trend going that it's usually kind of bad. Almost invariably bad, which is why we do the good thing before the bad thing. Lauren, what is your good thing this week? McCluskey! Oh, yeah! It was Friday, and uh, what a pander to us 40-year-olds. Wow! <laughs> I got... It was Muppet Christmas Carol level pandering to exactly what my stupid little nostalgia brain wanted. Oh, it was great. It was very cool. And it was like a lot of, you know, <laughs> I say a lot of songs that I never thought I was going to get to hear um, because I discovered McCluskey after they split up. Um, Disbanded. Yeah. 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 Granted, I have, I have gotten to see Future to the Left quite a bit, uh, which asterisk because all mm. my, fr like, especially if they were in St. Louis, all my friends knew that I was excited about it, that we're at the show and by me shot. So I still have never remembered the end of a future of the left concert. Which I <laughs> don't, I never do that. Like that's, that's I don't, cause I like go listening to the music at a show and then mm -hmm, like remembering mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And so I very rarely even like get saucy, let alone, Oh no. Uh, and <laughs> so I actually was present for the entire but the the length of the performance and uh it was awesome and it was it was just like i mean I, I i was remembering i was like wait a second a lot of my friends and you know bands i've listened to like man people cover mccluskey like a lot and and because yeah. it's like a fun thing to throw in there and and it's, yeah. it's kind of a flex you know um and so I'm not ever, I was like, oh yeah, I have actually, I've heard this, but not from them. And mm. so I, yeah, we got every, I got all the songs. Like I got everything. Awesome. They played the new stuff. that was great. It sounded awesome. And it was just like, yeah. it was super fun. Um, I mean, it wasn't necessarily like, it also like wasn't packed. I mean, it's a very niche mm. kind of. Like in the grand yeah. scheme of things, it's pretty, they're very pretty much niche. one of those bands where, like, if you know, you know, you know, it's it's that that kind of that kind of thing. They do have kind of a cult following, you know. And we we've spoken about them quite a lot off brand, um, you know, and and I I I know a couple of their a couple of their folks, um, you know, which um which is fun. But they're I, school, I've seen, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the 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 basis of future of the left, who is. Andy Falco, the the um, the kind of driving force behind McCluskey yeah. and Future of the Left. Um, his wife is Julia Ruzico, who is the bassist of Future of the Left, who was principal at my university while I was there, which was a bizarre thing to realize um, yeah. where, when when it occurred. I had no idea until she delivered a presentation about herself and like how much she liked Queens of the Stone Age and whatever, and I was like. Oh, okay. This is this is minds were blown. Um, right. And and then, so yeah, 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 that's that's. I mean, that's a that's a cool kind of like. It's a funny yeah. connection, but yeah, yeah, it, um, yeah. It was you know, and we got like a friend of ours is like you know. Anyway, that's um a friend of ours is you know there and works at the venue, so like it's just it's a right. cool kind of connection and and it's an old venue the vic is super cool um and it just was like wow it was perfect that's, and it was that's awesome yeah it was really fun and and um yeah and it was it is kind of a they were word of mouth because like mm. i and x who i'm still you know like tight with and uh 
gets like full credit because it was one of these things where I was like, oh, what is that? I need as much of it as possible. And it got to the point yeah. where like I had all these like memories of like roller derby. We would sing. I'm fearful. I'm fearful. Flying is fearful in me. We'd like scream. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah, yeah. my gal Shanghai Lily was her Derby yeah. name. We'd like scream it in each other's faces and yeah. do a couple, yeah. like a couple of, uh, you know, helmet bonks makes you feel real excitable yeah. you know get, yeah, your real. get your blood up yeah yeah see so I, I, I can i can be jealous of you on this account because i've seen future of the left many times i've seen future of the left perform mccluskey songs but i've never actually seen mccluskey so you know you've got you've got one oh, me there yeah i never had they didn't perform mccluskey that's why i was so conf i was i was like i wonder what we're gonna hear because i they didn't it was all future left only whenever right I'd yeah 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 seen them so, yeah. uh yeah it was awesome tight. It was tight. Awesome. We got banter. We got got sick banter. Oh yeah, best yeah. banter. Fal Falco's a very very Hands funny human down. being. Yeah, yep. I made yep. a peep show joke with someone I did not know that was close to me, and you know, and we we're like, oh, this is the crowd. I'm like, yeah, they could probably just Delightful. put on three episodes of Peep Show right now, and we'd yeah. be fine. <laughs> Absolutely. And like, yeah, absolutely. This just, is just have them on, on, on a projector behind the band, you know, and everyone would be into it. Yeah, like Peep Show, <laughs> Mr. Show. Like, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's yep. like, that would be, that would be, everybody be into it. Anyway, that's my, it was, it was, it was super tight. And I'm wearing my, wearing my McCluskey shirt that they had oh, the last, nice. the last, last one of these, which like, it, yeah, they, even their merch was tight. It was all, they, they're doing great. It's weird. Fantastic. That, yeah. I'm usually very like, oh, reunions, whatever. This is different though. Like they're, yeah, yeah. It felt a little like unfinished business. So I feel like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. it makes perfect sense to me. This is, that's great. This doesn't feel like, you know, a cash grab from a bunch of old dudes sitting in recliners. Yeah, right. Stuff. Yeah. There, there's artistic merit behind it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's still, mm -hmm. there's still juice in the tank. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Right. So what's your mm -hmm. good thing? My good thing is uh, on a completely different subject. Um, so, so uh, as um, as as we we explored a little bit in uh, in the off brand this week, you know, I, when I when I sit down with Russell, I do my my preference is to kind of deal with it in a big chunk, and so I am sat there kind of watching um, for a while, and we, we, which often leaves me, you know, kind of. A little bit listless sometimes if I get a little bit bored of his content or whatever else. Yeah. Um, and 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 so my my good thing this week is Lego. It's Lego, and uh, I, I I unearthed in the move this Lego set that I got a while ago of uh, of London, um, which is car. <laughs> uh, viewers can see it. Right. Um, yeah, and so I, while 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 dealing with Russell this week, I, I I built a Lego set of London, and we've we've got the the National Gallery over here. We've got big Ben um, and 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 all that good stuff. We've got um, London Bridge and we got um, uh, the 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 London Eye as well, uh, which is uh, yeah, that's been that's been nice. It's it's a it's a calming influence while <laughs> while listening to horrible horrible things. Uh, so I've heard is, the yeah. guys episode they did on Lego guys <laughs> was very <laughs> enlightening. Though while there still can be people that can get very upset about Lego, mm, it does absolutely it, it does. Um, I mean, shout out to the flub heads. That was it, it's so fun to hear. Just like, I mean, I feel like it's a much lower bar to entry, like the model train for the mm. like for the dads, like yeah, dads yeah, yeah. everywhere, because model trains are a lot. <laughs> they are a lot. I'm just, I'm no disrespect for to the train people out there. I'm just I think a lot of trains. You well, know? I think yeah. a lot of respect. But like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. all the respect yeah. in the world. It's very cool. Yeah, My, yeah you know. I, I've never like, I've I've never delved into like Warhammer and that kind of thing. You know, the p painting of the models yeah. and all that. I probably would enjoy it, but I, I've, I've again, that feels like a lot to kind of take on. Um, whereas, uh, whereas, yeah, I've I've always loved Lego sets. <laughs> As a person got, who has to buy mm. enamel paint, yeah, it's right, a yeah, yeah. Also, it's, it's also, gotten... also expense, yeah. Ex yeah exponentially worse mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah Recently, so I'm, 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 I'm sticking to my lego oh. for now I've, I've 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 built a couple of pirate ships already in the past a couple of big pirate ships which i really like um and uh and yeah i'm happy with my thing of london i like their architecture series they've got an architecture series that's really cool oh because um, yeah i got way curious because of the mm. episode of guys and they're talking about 
you know, Lego guys. And I was like, I have to see this typewriter. I have to see what the fuck they're talking about. Right, so right. I like poked around on the website quite a bit. And yeah, there's such cool stuff. They like, such they cool do stuff. like, like pretty awesome job. Like they yeah. do. Like I was tempted a couple. I was like, oh, that. That's not very expensive. Those look extremely mm, cool. And it's like, so well, fun. no, I'm not going to, but <laughs> uh, it, it, yeah. I appreciate it. It's, I think it's neat. Like, it's I, like yeah. no notes. I, I yeah. mean, yeah. pricey. Yeah. Guess expensive. Yeah, some of it. Some of it. Yeah. If you can get it secondhand, all the better. Um, like, they, they've, they've yeah. got some Lord, Lord, of the, Lord of the Rings ones out. And I'm like, oh, those are pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll wait and see if I can get them for cheaps. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's kept me in a more pleasant kind of place um, while nice. dealing with, um, I've already told you, we do have a doozy of a show this week. And, sure. and I needed the Lego. I'm, I'm going to say I needed the Lego. Um, <laughs> now, we have a show to do. Uh, but first, we should thank some new patrons uh so first up we have the great pumpkin you are now an awakening wonder you are indeed an awakening wonder the great pumpkin Lies i love your work please. thank you so much <laughs> thank you big thank fan you. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and meredith martin you are now an awakening wonder you are indeed an awakening wonder thank you meredith thank Very you so much, much. Um, lovely name as well. I like the name. Yeah. Uh, and if anyone wants to support us in what we do, become an Awakening Wonder, join the Invisible Hand, or donate on an elevated tier, head to patreon.com slash onbrand, and you will have our eternal gratitude. It is this which allows us to be editorially independent and ad-free. Uh, as a patron, you will also get a shout-out on the show and access to our patron-only show, Off Brand, where we discuss anything but Russell Brand, except this week we did do a fair bit of discussion around Russell Brand, uh, because we had a little, uh, behind the scenes content showing how the sausage is made or rather how an episode of on brand is put together before getting into some research methodology and going through it in real time and also having a bit of a discussion around it uh which was which was cool I'm, yeah I hope yeah i have i had a little more like i don't know i i felt very analyzy mm. <laughs> i but like i you know i don't know i think i think it's always it's just too too tempting, and I think it's also important and interesting to see. Like, where is this guy come? Where where are the cracks in the? Yeah, and we can explore where are the cracks in the in the foundation for this these kind of shows. Like, mm -hmm. we can look at kind of we looked more I think at the the way um, that maybe the it's it, more applicable to like all of the content that we're covering it's you know looking at these patterns and seeing how people mm. manipulate sources all that kind of stuff yeah which we can't yeah, really cover all the time in the show how to um so how, how to really kind of get stuck into the the research side of it um and, yeah and and yeah. you know how, how to how to try and do that in an exhaustive fashion because you know we ran into in that episode the problem where there was just nothing there yeah. <laughs> because you know people are making shit up or finding it on forums or whatever else um yeah th so that, that was uh very interesting and i, I I hope our patrons enjoy. Yeah. Um, so, you know, head to patreon.com slash to check that out. Uh, and please note that while you can easily listen to our audio version anywhere you can find podcasts, you can also watch us on YouTube, or if you listen in the Spotify app, the video will come up there as well. Now then, in terms of Russell's content this last week, we've had a, you know, slew of editorials affirming the likes of Alex Jones, Elon Musk, and of course, Donald Trump. Um... But what we're looking at today is once more an interview. Uh, now, the past couple of weeks, we've had bigot Rand Paul um, and uh, Nazi supporter Mike Benz on the show, um, which doesn't seem like a great trajectory to be on. And so I did wonder in the back of my mind if we could get yet more ghoulish. And well, to find out, let's let Russell introduce the guest. Hello there, you Awakening Wonders. Thanks for joining me today for Stay Free with Russell Brand. We've got an extraordinary show for you. The first 15 minutes will be broadly available. You might be watching it somewhere else. You're like a peeping Tom peering over a fence at somebody else's private business. Because after the first Good. 15, we will be exclusively available in that sweet stream that we know as Rumble. Why? Because free speech is our ethos and our edict. And if you're speaking to Charlie Kirk... You gotta speak freely because I'm asking him, why does he believe in Trump? Have the right taken Trump to task when it comes to subjects like mm. vaccines, Christianity, and indeed what Trump's second term would look like. 
Oh, that's right. <laughs> Lauren, Lauren has left the building, everybody. Um, Lauren, Lauren has has left the room and the building. And oh no, oh no, they're back. Hi, hi. I was gonna um, get a paper bag to breathe in as a bit. <laughs> yeah, because and then I we have. I'm too defeated. I'm. T uh, mm. It's it's already a day. Um, we we have Charlie Kirk. Founder and CEO of Turning Point USA on Stay Free with Russell Brand. What um, the fuck? Really? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Uh. So, like, last week, one of our listeners uh, described Mike Benz as one of the more dangerous characters to come on Russell's show. And I am inclined to agree, but I, I do think that with Charlie Kirk here, we have upped the ante. Um, this is, this is worse. This is, this is a problem. And it's, it's difficult to concisely describe just how bad news Charlie Kirk is. Um, so let's start with current reach and influence, and then we'll take a little look back at where he came from and the things he says out loud into a microphone. Um, so Turning Point USA is a nonprofit uh, that advocates for conservative politics on high school, college, and university campuses. Specifically, they claim to be promoting the free market and limited government. Um, in 2022, they had a revenue of $55 million. Um, so, mm, uh, they have a presence on over 3,000 campuses nationwide in the U.S., with over 650,000 lifetime student members, apparently. Um, Charlie Kirk himself has appeared on CNBC, Fox News, and Fox Business News well over a thousand times. Um, he is also a columnist at Newsweek, and his writing has been published in Fox News, The Hill, Real Clear Politics, The Washington Times, Breitbart, American Greatness, and The Daily Caller. Uh, his social media reaches over 100 million people per month, and according to Axios, he is, or at least was, one of the top 10 most engaged Twitter handles in the world. Um, Charlie is the host of the Charlie Kirk Show podcast, which regularly ranks among the top 10 news shows on Apple Podcast Charts, and uh, ranks within the top 20 most popular podcasts in general, and is also a syndicated nationally, um, it's a syndicated nationally radio show on the uh, Salem Radio Network. Uh, the podcast specifically is aimed at Gen Z. Um, mm. Kirk is the William F. Buckley Jr. Council Member of the Council for National Policy, um, a group that, quote, has served for decades as a hub for the nationwide network of conservative activists and the donors who support them, unquote, according to the CNP's September 2020 membership directly, uh, directory that was leaked in 2021. <laughs> um... Yeah, so in, in terms of the scope of this guy's influence, I'd say it rates about an oh fuck out of ten. Uh, that's that's where <laughs> that's where I sit. This guy is a big fish um in this particular There market. are moments in mm. this show where mm. I know my like my media diet and my own like self abuse, right? Like mm. comes through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is not the first time in my head. That scene from Snatch where mm. Tyrone, the rally, the guy's like, I had a rally course. He's the getaway driver. I believe his name was Tyrone. Uh, no. Mm. I, I don't remember. Now I'm doubting. Anyway, I thought it was. Uh, but yeah, he's like in this group of dudes that are that are kind of petty criminals, but he's been a getaway driver before. And Brick yeah, Cop yeah, shows yeah. up and the other guys are like, I'll go look who you are. And he's like, I know who you are. And he's really sad. Yeah, he knows exactly who Bricktop is, and his friends that are like a little more casual criminals don't. And I just, I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm in it. I know exactly who Charlie Kirk is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I had no doubt that you would. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, okay. it, it is that very same. Like, oh. Fuck. I'm gonna get um, fed to pigs. I'm gonna get fed to pigs. Yes, it's it's, Great. That, it's that feeling kind of going into this. And I, I, I um cool. yeah, yeah. The the wet fish that I have to slap you with this week yeah. is especially large. Um so where did this guy come from and what are those things he keeps saying out loud to apparently hundreds of millions of people?
people. Um, well, Charlie Kirk is 30 years old and set up Turning Point USA in 2012, uh, meaning he was 18. Prior to that, he'd grown up in Illinois and uh, in his junior year in high school volunteered for the U.S. Senate campaign of Republican Mark Kirk. Uh, to which he has no relation, incidentally. Weird. Uh, he, he, I don't yeah, like that. Is, I don't like yeah. that. That's always weird to me. Uh, he also wrote an essay for Breitbart, alleging liberal bias in high school textbooks, uh, which led to his very first appearance on Fox Business. Uh, after high school, uh, Kirk briefly attended Harper College, a junior community college near Chicago, but quickly dropped out. Uh, in 2015, he did claim that he, he had applied at this time to West Point, the U.S. Military Academy, and was not accepted. Um, he, said, uh, he said that the slot he considered his went to a far less qualified candidate of a different gender and a different persuasion, um, whose test scores he claimed he knew. Uh, he later name, name names who yeah yeah right who? he la he later told the New Yorker that he was being sarcastic when he said it mm. um and even later than that told the Chicago Tribune that he was just repeating something he'd been told and then at a at a, at a turning point event featuring Rand Paul no less uh Kirk claimed that he never actually said it at all uh, <laughs> so so that's fun um Progress, anyway you know <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> Uh, back Jesus to 2012. Like, so how did Turning Point USA get started? Well, after his appearance on Fox Business, Charlie Boy attended a speaking engagement at the private Roman Catholic University, Benedictine University in Illinois, and met Bill Montgomery, who was, at the time, a Tea Party-backed legislative candidate. Montgomery encouraged Kirk to get engaged in political activism full-time and then joined him in founding Turning Point USA. At the 2012 RNC, Kirk, uh, Charlie Kirk met Foster Fries, um, a longtime Republican mega donor, who then injected seed money into the idea. So, what are the actual activities? Uh, like, can you imagine just fucking like all you need to do is just go and ask someone for money? Jesus Christ! Chicago um, Land has so much to answer for. Uh, truly, oh. truly, the Chicago Land area, Jesus and like Christ. and conservative nightmares. There's so mm -hmm. much to answer for. So, what are the actual activities of Turning Point USA? Um, so, one prominent example is the Professor Watch List, uh, which supposedly serves to uh, expose and document college professors who discriminate against conservative students and advance leftist propaganda in the classroom. Uh, you can find these professors by university, but also by subject on their website, varying from COVID-19 to LGBTQ rights, to abortion, to feminism, to climate alarmist, anti-Second Amendment, anti-law enforcement. And there's one for anti-Semitism that in reality is documenting those supporting Palestine in the current ongoing genocide. Mm -hmm. um, so not, not actual cases of anti-Semitism. <laughs> this is great. Um, it's a horrifying project that really does evoke some serious McCarthyism vibes. Um, not, not thrilled. There yeah. is also... Anti-Zionism is not the same as anti-semitism not the same as anti-semitism no, say it. no that, that is yeah i, I, I think uh <sighs> we, we can we can affirm that as the position of this podcast everybody um so there, there is also school board watch list um which is apparently quote dedicated to protecting our children by exposing radical and false ideologies endorsed by school boards and pushed in the classroom uh sbwl finds and exposes school board leadership that supports anti-american American radical, hateful, immoral, and racist teachings in their districts, such as critical race theory, the 1619 project, sexual slash gender ideology, and more, unquote. Um, yeah, a very similar website to the Professor Watchlist exists for that one, which, um, again, great. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then there's Turning Point Academy. Um, so... <laughs> Mm -hmm. I bet. So, 
According to their, their website, Turning Point Academy is, quote, dedicated to reclaiming the education of our children, reviving virtuous education focused on truth, goodness, and beauty, and restoring God as the foundation of education. Um, and elsewhere, quote, Turning Point Academy is committed to curating and, where needed, creating free, high-quality curriculum and resources that facilitate teaching and learning excellence, advancing godly and virtuous education, uh, unquote. And they are also uh, dedicated to equipping and encouraging pedagogical and administrative excellence through conferences, workshops, and online training of educators. Uh, so to give you a feeling for the vibe of Turning Point Academy, at the bottom of their website, they've got three statistics in bright red, right? Very alarming. Uh, and, and they say 69.2% uh, of eighth graders fall below basic proficiency levels in reading. That's one. 73% uh, of eighth graders fall below basic math competency levels. That's two. And number three is 93% uh, of students report to have been taught CRT or gender-related concepts in school. Just above these statistics is the phrase, there's a problem, be part of the solution. Um, so putting children's literacy on the same level as, uh, as being taught about slavery. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, like, like I said... Big wow, big bad in in Charlie Kirk. Um, yeah, he's 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 OG. He's he's an OG big bad. Mm -hmm. He's none of these newfangled. Yeah. He's he, he, bad guys. He's he's been around. I I, I, and, I can't yeah. believe he's still around. It's incredible. Well, and and he's only fucking thirty. You know that this is the thing that gets me is like this guy is only just fucking starting. Um. Um. So briefly before we get to him saying things on Russell's show, let's take a look at some of the things he said elsewhere. Um. To start, he's not big on telling the truth. Um. A February twenty twenty. Brookings Institution study found Kirk's podcast contained the second highest proportion of false, misleading, and unsubstantiated statements in a study which reviewed 36,603 episodes produced by 79 prominent political podcasters. Um, so he, he was the second most full of shit. Um, How do you even do that? I know. How do you get... Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, man. It's impressive. It's impressive both from him and from the people doing that study. More power to them. Um, <laughs> on on yeah. top of that, uh, he, he's described trans people as a middle finger to God um, and really does not like black people. Uh, in January 2024, just a couple of months ago at America Fest, uh, which featured Donald Trump Jr., Tucker Carlson, and Matt Gates, Charlie Kirk said, quote, I have a very, very radical view on this, but I can defend it, and I've thought about it. We made a huge mistake when we passed the Civil Rights Act in the 1960s. Oh. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, I've always seen Charlie Kirk as kind of like that linchpin, the, the like, the, the, um, you know, pin in the board from the string between like Lyndon LaRouche and, and like David Duke, like these kind of like public. Right racist right. and then yeah. like there's charlie kirk and then he's kind of another like disseminate because like steve bannon too you know is that kind of like is is, is one an, is an in-between and then yeah. they're they're sending it out into not you know they're, they're taking it from like stormfront to oan like they're with Th this is usa it. I it is very similar i think it, as far as like um market share right has Yes. Or audience capture, right? As yeah, like, yeah. As like an OAN or something. They're not main, the, but they're under there. And the the thing that strikes away. me, the thing that strikes me about Charlie Kirk is that he is he is probably one of the most effective people at moving the Overton window further to the right. Yeah. Um, you know, he takes the most extreme shit um that he can find um and palatably tries to present it um to to millions and millions of people um and a good chunk of them accept it um so so in in that sentiment uh, about the civil rights act he's arguing that the civil
Civil Rights Act, which, you know, bars discrimination on the basis of race, ushered in a permanent DEI-type bureaucracy, right? So, so diversity, equity, and inclusion. And he continues, quote, the courts have been really weak on this. Federal courts just yield to the Civil Rights Act as if it's the actual American Constitution. You've got to be fucking unquote. kidding me. It's, well, it's, it, it, it's, it is, it's, okay. it's the law. Yeah, it's, it's it's we we live in a system of common law. The courts yeah. have to follow the law. That's literally how the how the system works. You dingus. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. um, and and according to him, the law is ultimately a way to refound the country and a way to get rid of the First Amendment. Hmm. Okay. Okay. That's a uh, language to pay attention to. Refound yeah. the country is, mm -hmm. and I've fortunately. I've seen more reporting about it lately, like the idea mm. that they're using originalism and they're using, you know, the Supreme Court and they're like, there's, there is a doctrine knocking around in the back rooms of people like Charlie Kirk, where mm. they want to remake the country into even something that the founders, like they want to invoke the spirit of the founders but they don't mm. want to actually like they're throwing out anything that was reasonable that well, those yeah, dudes and, came and, up with. And, which and quite a bit of systems are interesting and would work well if they were supported and, and were applied equally. Yeah, yeah. And 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 you know, the the refound the country sentiment is is um uh especially when we're talking about about the Civil Rights Act, like he's very much talking about great replacement shit here. That's 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 what he's saying is oh the, the black people are trying to take over everybody. Um, you know, and uh that's that's the that's the undertone um under underlying honestly a lot of what Charlie Kirk says, I found. Yeah. Um well, the refound now, as, is like we're, it's hearkening mm. back to a previous. It's make America great again. It's like again, you know, refound. Like, oh well, when we founded it, listen, everything made sense. Whenever <laughs> slavery was legal and yeah. most people weren't voting or yeah, human, right, like right. full human exactly. rights. So exactly. that's like it, it, any kind of like language that's 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 regressive in that way mm. pricks my, you know, like that's that's. That's a dog mm -hmm. whistle that I hear. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -mm 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 -mm. Nope, nope, yeah, nope. and and speaking of dog whistles, as as a, as a more kind of um, as as a less sinister example of his bigotry, should I say, in, in response to the 2022 Super Bowl halftime show, right, the one with Dr. Dre, Eminem, Snoop Dogg, Fifty Cent, and Mary J. Blige. Um, honestly, I think one of the best. Super Bowl halftime shows of all time, in my opinion. Um, Charlie Kirk said, quote, uh, the NFL is now the league of sexual anarchy. This halftime show should not be allowed on television, unquote. <laughs> sexual <a> anarchy. Dweeb. <laughs> That's what he got from that. Ooh, nerd. Some of him is swirly. Uh, oh, dear. He lives, a, uh. lives a, a, a swirly-less existence, and I don't think that's correct. Yeah, right. Uh, 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 his oh head boy. should he should be upside down with his head. <laughs> yeah, or maybe maybe I don't know, he needs to invest in a sex toy. He needs to do something to 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 I don't know, make his life more interesting, clearly. Uh mind numbing uh, stuff. Let's not, anyway. Okay. <laughs> Well, Super I mean, don't want sexual... to think about that. I don't know why yeah, we're going true. there. <laughs> he brought up sexual anarchy. That You're wasn't me. That was us. him. That was him. Yeah, well. That's true. This is true. Um, so, so the list of reasons that this guy is terrible is honestly too long for me to fully recount here. Um, because yeah. the, believe me, there yeah. is a lot more. Yeah. There is a lot more. We can't. Um, we can't. Mm -hmm. And not just because I don't want. Like I'm saying, like it's not. There's way too much. <laughs> We, He's been it at would this have for to be a long an, time. Yeah. yeah, it would have to be an entirely separate podcast, and that's yeah. not a, that's not a thing I'm willing to do. Uh, but su suffice to say, this guy is extremely bigoted, extremely influential, and a Christian evangelist, which will come up later with our darling uh, darling Christian zealot of a host, Russell. Um, first, however. Let's get into the first clip that we have of Charlie, and I'm going to skip briefly past the introduction um, onto the show proper to the first issues that Russell wants to discuss. And honestly, in a lot of ways, this clip does tell us all we need to know about this guy. 
Charlie, can we like first of all look at a couple of contemporary stories like this Boeing? Uh, like we're talking about John Barnett's uh, uh, self death by his own hand, or whatever you want to call it. It's very convenient for Boeing that a man who consistently testified against their safety from a position of some experience and authority is now unable to testify further. When you see a story like that, what's what's your assessment of it, Charlie? Well, you can't help but think, is there foul play involved? Again, I don't know. I know none of the details. I, I know nothing, and I don't want to speculate beyond that. But, you know, those of us that love the truth and those of us that are kind of combining forces, we see a pattern. And I believe God made us in a way to recognize pattern and patterns and pattern recognition is important, which is when you see kind of unusual glitches in how things should operate. For example, I mean, when you see whistleblowers at the origination of the spread of COVID just disappear in mainland China, and we're just told, oh, no, it's just fine. You know, happens all the time that scientists just kind of just disappear. Or when Epstein, quote unquote, killed himself in a prison cell. All the, and again, I don't know anything about this. It could just be that this guy was dealing with mental health issues and the pressure was too much. I, I know nothing about the details there, but it smells. And by the way, the same thing with... Uh, Mitch McConnell's sister-in-law uh, that's connected to the Chinese Communist Party uh, shipping company. I don't know if you saw that story in no. Texas. Um, it was, I, I, I think her, something Chow, um, where she just, I suppose, got into her Tesla and went backwards into a lake. And uh, suspicious, it's being investigated as a criminal matter in Texas. Again, I don't know if foul play was involved there. But yeah, we're starting to writing in a Tesla. I think people now have the courage <laughs> to mm. put one and one, two and two together and say, it, it, are there other clandestine subterranean forces that are trying to remove truth tellers, whistleblowers or threats to their current power structure? Um, and or do they just want to try to go back to this idea that, you know, dead men are dead men tell no lies or dead, dead men are not able Total to testify. Tales. So I don't know what to make oh, of it, Russell, except for the you. fact that in the new kind of the new normal, when I see a story like this, I immediately start to suspect foul play more than just the narrative that we're being fed. And that is largely because we have been routinely manipulated by the mainstream apparatus, by the establishment, which is the term that I love that you used. And again, it could be that the normal explanation is the normal explanation. But if anything, if there's any lesson out of the last four years after 15 days to slow the spread, it's that there's almost Ugh. always more to the story than what the establishment is telling us. Oof. I mean, um, the button hmm. on it wasn't wrong. I know what I'm coming from a very different angle than mm. he's coming from. But like, mm -hmm. I don't like that. Like, well, the last thing you said was not wrong. A bunch of stuff in the middle that was wiggity yeah i i will say you know as someone who attempted suicide not that long ago i do kind of resent the idea that it has to be a conspiracy um yeah you know sometimes things suck and people's mental health isn't that great um that that also does happen um and yeah you were right dead men tell no tales is the phrase that he was desperately searching for there or possibly he avoided it because it is also a reference to a pirates of the caribbean movie uh <laughs> so. i mean <laughs> I don't know that they had first dibs on that, but okay. no, no, no. Um, yeah. So, so what, what's initially being discussed in that? Um, firstly, firstly, you, you you had the um, you know whistleblower in China thing. That's that's the same thing that we covered in the Rand Paul episode. Um, you know, according to him, disappearing is like no, he he died um, of of COVID, tragic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the, the what's then being discussed after that is the self-inflicted uh, death of John Barnett, um, a man known for being a whistleblower against Boeing. Um, and for those not in the know, I think this is a fairly ubiquitous story. But nonetheless, um, after retiring, he embarked on a long-running legal action against the company. Um, he accused them of denigrating his character and hampering his career because of the issues he pointed out, charges which were rejected by Boeing. Um, and at the time of his death, Barnett had been in Charleston for legal interviews linked to that case. He gave a formal deposition in which he was questioned by Boeing's lawyers before being cross-examined by his own counsel, and he had been due to undergo further questioning um, the following Saturday. When he did not appear, inquiries were made at his hotel. He was subsequently found dead in his truck in the hotel car park. Um, you know, it's it's pretty tragic stuff, and, you know, as you It doesn't imagine, look good. It, it does doesn't, not look right. good. 
that that that's the thing like as you'd imagine the conspiracy minded side of the internet is going buck wild over this story and you know to me it rings alarm bells um you know be, be, because yeah doesn't look good seems, honestly i was holding my breath i'm like i don't seems, know where we're gonna go with this i no, it, i think it's, it's fucking crazy i think it's it seems it's, very suspect and and the the reality is we don't have a definitive answer right now definitely um, not yeah there's you know, a lot of stuff I, that's crazy but also we don't have that kind of like legal framework to say this is like the yeah yeah, yeah. like i'm i i tend to err towards the side of um of of John Barnett taking his own life, and and you know for 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 my from my personal position, it falls apart a little bit in terms of motive on Boeing's side for me. Like the the whistle had kind of already been blown a while ago. John Barnett, I don't think, was coming forward with any new information, and even had Boeing lost the suit, it wouldn't have been you know in any kind of amounts that would have seriously caused the company concern financially. You know they're worth 110 billion dollars, etc. Yeah, um, if there weren't other cases that were like why are you even worried about this amount of money you're gonna get away with it like if that if there mm. wasn't other cases like you know in the octopus they talk about it like it, there's like why aren't we just settling this you're gonna yeah. get away with it so yeah. there's there could be stuff we don't know i, I just i think that like true. it's absolutely it's very true. like it's weird and there was a point i mean this is i'm just being silly but it's a silly thing and it works in this very moment that like maybe because boeing is so bad at doing everything else that maybe they did this bad too like <laughs> this is, is, you yeah. know <laughs> it was like a jeff yeah. galuli but we're like guys we're not doing this uh the, you didn't send your best man maybe uh you know like that like who knows i mean yeah it's it's very possible they've um, got a lot of yeah. qc problems is what i'm saying <laughs> yes yeah that is absolutely definitely the case um and 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 uh, as well as motive there is also uh, the bitter reality that whistleblowers are generally treated very poorly in uh, our society um more often than not they lose the community of people um with whom they used to work and associate themselves and are treated as social pariahs in a lot of ways while also suffering a hell of a lot of stress from whatever organization they're blowing the whistle against yeah um, that's the thing then, that's mm, the thing and then, it's like and then throw throw in a long-running lawsuit where you're trying to kind of reclaim your reputation and it, it's it's a lot of pressure with probably very little support and so so it's feasible that the the that it could um that it, it is happened, yeah you know. well and and I, like since 2016 or something like has been at it and yeah. a legal battle that takes that long is a nightmare. That's yeah. the thing. And even mentioning Jeffrey Epstein, right? Yeah. That's the other example. Of like, okay, best case scenario, mm. Jeffrey Epstein should not have been allowed. Like the situation that whatever happened to Jeffrey Epstein, like shouldn't have been allowed. Should yeah. That should not have been the case It like mm -hmm. to begin with. Um, you know, like all the, all the different, like the, the environment that he, you know, what, for whatever happened to him happened, mm. that shouldn't have been allowed anyway. In the same no. way that like this man did not have another reason necessarily, no one in his life is coming forward and saying that like he had another reason that would have, you know, like this, mm. a, a corporate, um, you know, like a corporation being allowed to terrorize someone for years, um, is not, and maybe pushing them to this point is, uh, also bad. That's like, that's mm. like best case scenario. Um, trying to be a whistleblower against this, like obviously problematic, like we're seeing the results happen in real time and we have been. Yep. yep. And so like even pushing someone to that point is also a, like, let's reckon with any of the reasons, like, any of the reasons that this could have happened in any mm. scenario, all of them rest on Boeing. Like that's, yeah. it's all Boeing's fault at the end of the day. And like, I think that it's, it is disheartening to see that whatever happened with Jeffrey Epstein, it just nothing. We're not seeing, I mean, you know, just Maxwell is in jail and that's great, but like, we're not mm. seeing any repercussions for like, we're all, we all watched this like monstrous nightmare unfold all of us and mm. there's like fucking no consequences and pretty much just that's i think invoking that 
seems so, oh my gosh. Are we going to talk about the Tesla thing anymore? Is yeah, that- yeah, yeah. I'm going to get to it in just a sec. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, but, but, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so in terms of John Barnett, you know, I, I don't have the answers, Um, but I will say, I think I know a damn sight more than Charlie Kirk does here because he comes with the admission to not knowing a single thing about the details of the story, Um, which surprising um but even yeah. even then without knowing anything he's like mm, seems fishy um um you know w- without knowing anything other than what russell has just said supposedly um anyway and and then he tries to insinuate the death of uh, yeah mitch mcconnell's sister-in-law and shipping ceo angela chow um was foul play um you know and, and that one uh, that one was a different kind of tragedy with chow um apparently accidentally putting her Tesla Model X into reverse rather than drive, backing into a pond and subsequently subsequently drowning. Um, The sheriff's office wrote that their preliminary investigation determined it to be an unfortunate accident. However, given that it was not a typical accident, the office is investigating it as a criminal matter until they have sufficient evidence to rule out criminal activity. Um, I think I, I do think the idea of it being a murder is pretty far fetched. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but that yeah, that, yeah. that seems to be what Charlie Kirk is advancing here. Yeah, uh, well, it's a murder in the way that Tesla murders people. through negligence. Yeah, like yeah, yeah it's, there's a negligence that like Teslas are cars, not mm. hair dryers. So cutting corners and making shitty products. Mm. Uh, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't, it, we don't call it murder. I, I yeah. kind of do. <laughs> yeah, it 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 could be it it could be murder by corporation kind of a kind of situation. Um, well, yeah, you know, everything is you know. like the 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 underlying problem is um corporate deregulation. On like yeah. this, we're living through this is what this is what happens. This is what people have been screaming about for decades. Yeah, they said that this would happen, and this is exactly what's happening. It is funny that you won't hear that uh, argument advanced by the guy who regularly promotes the free market. Um, this is funny that. Uh, um, so yeah, yeah, just just a lot of um, a lot of kind of not knowing anything about the situations, but being like, is it me? It could be me, and and that's you know. From well, the, the Tesla thing is weird because if if he's talking about Elon Musk, or is that in this episode, or is it that just what Russell's been up to? Oh, that's just what Russell's been up to. Yeah, well, no, he, he's, he's he's talking about Musk and Don Lemon. Uh, well, we but these yeah. things keep coming up, like as you know, we talked a couple of weeks ago about like Elon Musk allowing Ty Rachek back on mm. X Twitter, mm-hmm. or like this. The husband was talking mm. about how like oh he still loves his Teslas, mm. even though this is probably fucking malfunction. That like yeah, if yeah. It, can you imagine somebody saying that about Ford? Like it's just it's it's this weird like virtue mm. it's virtue signaling. Yeah. And it's it's very odd. It's it's it, there's an there's a whole other environment that's happening that feels very disconnected from reality. Yeah. That people like Elon Musk and in fact Elon Musk is in the center of this like very strange orbit well it's, it's this cult of personality surrounding yeah. the guy isn't it you know and and and, and everyone what is going to personality by the way <laughs> i know do you know i How? watched the I, I watched the whole of the don lemon interview last night and uh oh boy <laughs> oh boy <laughs> well you know there's you know people that follow war followed warren <sighs> jeffs were in his cult were like he's just so charming and, and I, this is if if you follow cult news i think more mm. and more people are getting the, a whiff of this because it just because the documentation to true crime these days is so much more available, but like mm. talking about how enrapturing these leaders are. And then you hear them and it's like, like the most boring Kermit, the frog weird. Yeah. Like, yeah. so I say how, how do, what how personality do you find these people engaging. Yeah. But yeah. Somebody's yeah. out there plugging in, you know, and it's just like what the fuck but it's it's hard to i and i i i caution listeners i know that you don't take it seriously when you hear it or you probably don't mm. and that's very it's a hard kind of like that's a hard mental hurdle i think to to overcome is like just because because mm. it can sound very lame and weird and you're like mm. why would anyone be into this but you have to mm. kind of accept just like it, it just but that asterisk in your mind is like you know you got to accept that people do and it does 
feel crazy. It feels crazy, yeah. but we have to accept that. That like, mm. okay, this is a thing that's happening in the world and we got to deal with it. What are you going to do? Yeah, there, there's there's definitely a project there for psychologists worldwide, I think. <laughs> <laughs> to, to try and to try and nail that down um think, yeah they, they, uh, they've got it but the mm. whether we can do anything about it mm. right <laughs> um yeah now, uncharacteristically from Russell, uh, we get a bit of him pushing back on Trump uh, in this interview, um, with with Charlie Kirk, you know, being inextricably tied to the Trump campaign since 2016. Um, he is apparently the right person to be asking these questions. Um, and the first one that Russell has is regarding the sticky wicket of the COVID-19 vaccine. When there are paradoxes embedded even within that story, I wonder what we can learn from then. I, I, I understand that you, uh, as uh, my guess is that you're sort of a pretty pro-Trump person. And I know in the media space that I operate in, Trump is regarded just generally as a hero. My own political allegiances lie more in the diversification and decentralization of power wherever possible in order that the sovereignty of the individual is regarded as sacred, I mean that literally as well as uh, in a way that is politically useful. Uh, and so my support of anyone that claims from within this system uh, that, uh, that they could make significant change is always, always tentative. But probably I'd be more pro Bobby Kennedy than Trump. I'd love to know what our audience think. I know that oh, most of our audience are pretty pro Trump. Uh, but when it comes to like you've brought up the pandemic and what an incredible journey of learning it afforded all of us. See uh, how Trump maintains a degree of credit for the efficacy of warp speed while clearly caught in uh, the many Americans that now are furious about what happened in the pandemic period who might loosely be corralled under the term anti-vax. How do you see that contradiction playing out for Trump? Taking credit for the success of the vaccine, the, uh, courting the support of anti-vaxxers? Yeah, it's a very fair and important question, Russell. So let me just state my opinion. You know, I was against the lockdowns, the masks very early, never took the mRNA gene altering shot called a vaccine. I think it was a huge mistake. I believe we were lied to by Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Moderna, Johnson and Johnson. And so I, I see that that's my opinion. I think, you know, the audience would largely agree with me on there. And as far as with President Trump's record, I do want to just make it clear. He never forced the vaccine. He never was going to have any sort of punitive sort of measures. He also very early, his instincts were right. And I wish he would have trusted his instincts more. He was on hydroxychloroquine and how we can't lock down the country. Unfortunately, he was almost <laughs> yeah, enveloped and um, he was suffocated by the medical bureaucrats around him. And so it, it was it was this kind of slow squeeze. It was the boa, boa constrictor of the CDC and FDA here in the States and the NH, NHS would be the equivalent uh, in your country. Uh, no, it isn't. It uh, super isn't. First super of isn't. all, <laughs> the uh, so the NHS is our national health service, and and um, unfortunately, you don't have a comparable kind of not thing. even fucking um, close. No, <laughs> whereas infectious diseases and whatnot in this country fall under the purview of the UK Health Security Agency. Um, yeah, a little a little bit more talking shit about stuff he knows nothing about. That's just uh, weird. Like that's yeah. just weird. Like, I know yeah. Charlie Kirk knows what the NHS is. Yeah, yeah. Cle clearly he thinks it's, I don't know, broader reaching or whatever than than um, so the, than it actually is. Anyway, so Trump was misled. Um, that's the needle that we're trying to thread here, right? Never mind the, tr the fact that Trump has multiple times said how wonderful the vaccine itself is. No, no, no. He was misled by the boa constrictor of scientists and medical bureaucrats around him. Like, it never ceases to fascinate me how Trump can be both a genius and an easily led idiot, according to these people. Like, he's all-powerful and yet constantly hampered by that pesky deep state. <laughs> yeah, is he talking about Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, who he put in charge of the COVID response? Mm. That, like, that big pharma bureaucrat? Yeah, that, Come that, deep, on. that deep state cretin Jared Kushner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just dumb. Uh, it really is. Now, next uh, is a little uh, little campaign advice from Charlie to Trump. Right, my advice for pre 
for President Trump is to say, hey, my instincts were to go for early treatments and I was lied to by the pharmaceutical companies. I think it is a perfect opportunity. And President Trump is not a stranger to that kind of an argument. Think about it. How many times did he say that the FBI came after me? You know, the intel agencies came after me. It, it is a continuation of a narrative. Um, and I know you want to uh, get in here. Just last thing I'll say really quick is that if President Trump says that these pharmaceutical companies came into the White House and told me one thing and we saw another. And as president, I will do a criminal investigation into the big four, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Moderna, Johnson and Johnson. I think he could break out of this uh, potential political uh, problem, uh, especially with RFK running, who is nipping at his bud uh, right now in, in regards oh. to the vaccine issue. I'll tell you what, I, I'm excited about this bug. conversation that you Weird. and I are having already because it's a, a legitimate conversation where I don't feel like I'm just trying to frame questions in order to establish a position, but I am genuinely interested in, 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 in that, in, in what you're saying. <laughs> that, that, that does, I can't. Oh, girl. That does not speak very highly of some of Russell's other guests, does it? <laughs> you know? oh, I like this I, conversation. <laughs> I'm actually interested in what you have to say. How surprising. <laughs> well, he was just lying. That's well, how he yes, asks questions yeah. all the time to anyone. No, no, he, he's, say, he's saying this conversation is refreshing because he's not having to do that now. He has to do that he's the so rest confident. of the time. He just did it! He's, he also does quite a lot of that. Yeah! Um, he's yeah, just a liar. Yeah. He just says, he's explaining to you how he wants you to see him, regardless mm. of his behavior. That's what mm -hmm. he's doing in place of actually, like, doing what he says. He's just yeah. saying that, that's what he's saying. Yep, 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 yep. Also, the, the 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 nipping at Trump's bud thing. Weird. Like, I, it's it's he just can't quite get any popular phrase quite right. So like he gets halfway, he's like, ah, good enough. Yeah. You know? I mean, <laughs> and the I've thing been is, there. I, 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 get I it. didn't I didn't cut all the all the instances of him doing this into the, into our show. Yeah. Um, but like he does it like four or five times throughout that interview of just yeah. like random little phrases. And I'm like, what are you doing? Why? This is weird. <laughs> oh dear. If he's anyway. nervous, he doesn't seem like it. Seems like a real professional because. Man, yeah. I still yeah. call issues of magazines episodes all the time. That's a word I constantly like. My brain's just like that wire got crossed as an like adult. That. I kind of like that. Uh, no, because it's extremely no. confusing when I'm trying yeah. to have a conversation about <laughs> magazines and television at the same time. It's, which honestly doesn't really come up these days. Which yeah, makes yeah. It, I'm I, I'm out of practice. That actually makes it worse. But like yeah. I, that's the thing is like yeah. I can sympathize with that, but at the same time, it does make him seem like a an automaton. You know, like a glitching yeah. robot, like that does seem that yeah, way a little. Yeah, if, if if he's nervous, that is kind of uh, I don't know. That would be that would be interesting. Um, but you know, because his Russell's platform is way smaller than Charlie Kirk's. Um, That's the thing. Yeah, I, I but, think um, it's just. Yeah, it's, it's just who he is. I think. Um, I don't know. Not, Replace now, a circuit board. I'm not sure. Like maybe some soldering got loose. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe we'll we'll have to take him off to Zuckerberg to get fixed. Um, Russell continues the pushback um, in this next clip, asking, "What is a long-winded and brambly, but ultimately eventually reasonable question?" One question, though, <clears throat> if indeed. Trump's defense for what happened in that rather unique and difficult period is to be that it was establishment uh, mandarins and bureaucrats that strangled his authority. How can he claim that in a second term he will be able to impose authority in a distinct and different way? And will he, if he were to say that he was going to, would he not risk further accusations that what he was planning to bring to America was a form of dictatorship, which is precisely what his detractors on the neoliberal left are continually saying, whilst I recognize and consider, and just to let you know my position, I consider the biggest threat to our freedom to be the new strain of authoritarianism being all good under the auspices uh, of neoliberalism. That is the tyranny that we have to fear. I, no question about it. But but how would Trump do things differently this time without uh, playing into the hands of those that say he's going to slash bureaucracy and all that? Hmm. Yeah, so two things. Number one, you're right. The new authoritarianism, though, looks different than just a czar, a Caesar, or a king. The new authoritarianism is by committee. 
It's by oligarchy. It is by bureaucracy. It is by the secret society of intelligentsia that sit around and they agree that, you know, the Fauci's, the Burkses, they, they are largely the faceless, nameless, unidentified power structure within the Leviathan. So it, it, when people think of authoritarianism, they just think of Putin. When the new authoritarianism rests within the credentialed class, the managerial revolution that we've lived through through the West. I'm happy to explore that, but I just wanted to expound on that. So your mm. funders, so the guys who give you the money to do your, <laughs> that's what I hear. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. We 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 I'm lack of self analysis in terms of uh, oligarchy uh, question there. Um, yeah. So yeah, the the faceless, nameless, unidentified, but also credentialed class who have apparently formed a secret society of intelligentsia are apparently the ones running the world in authoritarian fashion by committee. Um, now I didn't know about this, but then again, it's a secret. So how would I? Uh, <laughs> um, it's 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 already pretty profoundly dumb. Uh, now I, I it's a it's a complete description of the way that he was f like his like that's that's how you get paid, sir. You just described <laughs> your business model, like your like your foundations, everything. Like that's you. Yeah, I that's I, you. I guess the the distinction is is the people funding him. I'm not sure whether whether they would be described by anyone as intelligentsia necessarily, but it's definitely old white men sat in a room. That's definitely the case. Intelligentsia old doesn't mean. I mean, it means. Like that's that's his demonizing thing, you know. That's that's like demonizing yes, academia. That's just well, throwing that's that in exactly, there. That's exactly it. Which also, um, all of these people go to like our legacy Ivy League. Like they they pretend to hate learning and knowledge, but they don't actually do it. Just like they everybody pretends that they didn't get vaccinated with it. A lot of these dudes absolutely did, but they still mm -hmm. want to. They want to use that kind of you know. They want they want to benefit off of the rhetoric for the rabble, but they don't actually apply that to themselves like they all have a, like yeah ties to academia like their names are on fucking buildings and shit like this is a yes yeah absolutely um and, and, and i think with with uh with, with charlie kirk there there is a more um prominent and extreme thread of um anti-intellectualism yeah um r running yeah. Through him. And, and and so i i so, like I, I don't think a university degree defines a person's inherent worth or intellect, right? Especially when there are usually various barriers, financial or otherwise, to that system of education. Um, that said, I do value education and or experience pretty highly if I'm going to listen to someone speak on a subject. Uh, the experience that Charlie Kirk has is parroting right-wing talking points through various media, media platforms since the age of 17, and doing that instead of going to college, which, for various reasons, alongside the things he says in this interview and elsewhere, leads me to believe that the only shit he knows is stuff that he has been fed from right-wing conspiracy, uh, conspiracy sites like 8chan, which he has been known to frequent, um, or the right-wing media sphere in general. Which is why it comes to the surprise of literally nobody that this incredibly influential picture of privilege is promoting anti-intellectualism in as many forms as he possibly can. Uh -huh. um, and why it makes perfect sense that his study found his podcast to be absolutely full of shit. Um, it's abundantly clear that the appeal of him and his show has nothing to do with the things that he supposedly knows. <laughs> Right. Because there's not much there. Uh, yeah. The hypocrisy oh, packed into like every statement is like mm. palpable, you know? Yes. It's dense. Very dense. Oh, yeah. um, another thought I have is just how troubling it is to have someone so apparently influential in the sphere of education who hates the very concept of people being educated. <laughs> but they're not even, oh. that's, yeah. Oh. Right. Yeah. But like, especially like Charlie Kirk, like he's not necessarily in, he's like a barnacle in education. He's not yeah. contributing anything to edu the educational oh. process or like he's not in the establishment. He just is allowed to latch on and be a leech and, mm -hmm. and, and inject poison. Like that's, that's so. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. He, they, he's, in, he's in the, um, you know, like, which like also, yeah, they are, they're in the room a lot. It's, it's very frustrating for their ability, like their ability to be anti-intellectual, be anti, you know, like anti-academia, but like you are 
so far. Also, you're so far in it. So mm. it's almost like they made a step and they being, um, you know, not just Charlie Kirk, but like a lot of, you know, like Liberty University and like there's there are like private Christian institutions that are kind of like making their own bubble of academia as they define it. Mm. And so you can like so you can somehow yours is different and like better and yeah, like which so, the numbers somehow. don't necessarily bear that out like it's it's just kind of it's almost like they've made a, a different like pod to be a part like well you won't actually let us in academia we're a barnacle with like this you know kind of like tendrils going in puppet master style the highline puppet master style but then also being in this little bubble of their own that they're making it's yeah. so fucking frustrating it's 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 a parasite trying to take over the host kind of yeah. situation yeah um you know ca causing active harm um rather than rather than being any kind of benefit um, so, so Russell continues to push Charlie on the subject of Trump, um, asking uh, another a surprisingly incisive question before we get a bit of a digression from Charlie Kirk. One of the things, though, I would say is like sometimes I wonder, and I said you're a good person to ask this question, if uh, the people that broadly support Trump, which is evidently a, a large, huge, potentially it looks likely an election winning demographic, are unwilling to hold him to account, per perhaps in the area of vaccine we've looked at already, possibly in some moral and ethical areas and maybe even some spiritual areas and significantly perhaps in when it comes to economics. After all, is Donald Trump not ultimately a free market capitalist who ultimately wants to empower the interests of an elite class just of a slightly different distinction. Do you really feel that Donald Trump is about the empowerment of blue collar, ordinary Americans of all colors, making America great again for the majority of Americans? So just there was quite a few points in there, Charlie, but yeah, let me take them one at a time. First of all, I love I love the Huxley reference, and I love it because he he was able to paint a picture of dystopia that was centered around an entrance into almost a comatose pleasure focused dictatorship. You know, everybody belongs to everybody. There's no such uh, there's no idea of personal privacy. Uh, everyone takes a drug that makes you feel amazing. It's called Soma in the book Brave New World. And in fact, there are five writers uh, and you, you'll appreciate this. Uh, the, the, I think almost all of them were four, four out of five were were British that were all contemporaries. C.S. Lewis, Churchill, Orwell, Huxley and Arthur Kessler, who I believe was Hungarian, who all wrote about totalitarian totalitarianism and dictatorship differently. And I encourage everyone to read that picture because it's a constellation of five different approaches. And they were dealing with this question though, Russell, and I, I will get to the, the, I, the, the, the Trump aspect. I don't, I don't want to dodge that, I'm which is say, how does technology and tyranny mm -hmm. work together? That was the question that all five were wrestling with, mm. which is a fascinating mm. Fascinating question. Orwell and Huxley flirted with that more than anybody else. I encourage everyone to read, though, Darkness at Noon by Arthur Kessler, which is exactly what Donald Trump is experiencing. It's, it was all about the Moscow show trials. It was about what happens when you forego due process. It's brilliant. They, they, they all lived in that late 1940s, 1950s and published some of the most important works that are instructed what we go today. Everyone goes immediately, Russell, in 1984, but 1984 is just one piece of kind of the let's say the, the the genre of warning against the the new totalitarianism of the 21st century okay uh so so but before we we get into this proper um russell you know yeah trump is a free market capitalist but also so is your boy bobby kennedy so you know i i don't, I don't know how you think those two are fundamentally different because they're not um now i uh yeah as as to as to this this kind of sent me on a little bit of a rabbit hole i'm gonna be honest um <laughs> So I, I I will accept that that Kessler, Orwell, Huxley, and C.S. Lewis were contemporaries in terms of you know authorship and essays and whatnot, often going back and forth on ideas, and each of them did write um, novels you know a, a, about authoritarianism, etc. Uh, but Winston Churchill is definitely a bit of an outlier amongst that group. Um, so much of an outlier that I kind of wondered where this specific grouping might be coming from. Yeah. And, 
What? Yeah, it feels weird. And I saw that you picked up on that. <laughs> um, and uh, so if you look for all of those names together, you start to see a number of pieces of media from a guy called Larry Arn, um, who is the uh, president of Hillsdale College, which is a private conservative Christian liberal arts college in Michigan. Um, he taught a course at Hillsdale called Ethics, Nature, and Totalitarianism, selected writings from C.S. Lewis, Aldous Huxley, George Orwell, Arthur Kessler, and Winston Churchill. As for why Winston Churchill is included, as a graduate student in England, Arne was the research director for Sir Martin Gilbert, the official biographer of Winston Churchill, uh, then editing the final six document volumes of the Churchill biography. So he's an expert on Churchill, kind of, and, and that's why he just kind of tacked that on there. He's like, oh, Churchill spoke about authoritarianism, because of, of course he did. He, you know, he, he was in a war against the Nazis, you know. Um, um, so Lar Lar Larry Arn, Larry Arn is a longtime Trump ally and good buddy of Dennis Prager of Prager U. Hmm. Um, yeah, Arn was appointed as chair of the 18-member 1776 Commission by Donald Trump. Um, this was, to jog everyone's memory, the commission to combat the New York Times Magazine's 1619 project, which serves to ensure that slavery is a subject properly taught and understood in America. Um, so the 1776 Commission was born to combat critical race theory and minimize the issue of slavery. Um, uh, another prominent member of the 1776 Commission was one Charlie Kirk. So <laughs> I really don't know if Charlie Kirk has read any of these books or if he's just parroting things that he has apparently learned from Larry R. <clears throat> I'm going to say ladder. That's where I'm betting in the pool. That would be my guess as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was a fun little rabbit hole for me to pin this guy down on. Uh <laughs> Because literally, wild. Lar Larry Arn is the only guy around putting those names together, pretty much. <laughs> and that's exactly like what we just talked about in Off Brand is like, mm. those are the little kind of like, it's weird when you can point pinpoint that kind of thing. Where it's yeah. like, oh, this is exactly yeah. why this, like this person, this pundit in front of me is rattling this stuff off. And that's where it's been stored in their brain. Mm -hmm. It's like you can mm -hmm. you can track down you know right wing memes and going viral and then magically we're talking about something completely off the wall on the news because some idea has caught fire in this little corner you know of the yes, of the internet exactly. or what do you know academia mm. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah Man. yeah yeah academia that terrible terrible thing mm. um, anyway let's get back to Trump after that brief <laughs> digression um, and and right so. When the camera eventually pans back to him, watch what Russell is doing while this guy is talking. Okay, so to Trump, yeah, to answer your question, yes. Uh, do I agree with everything that President Trump does? Of course not. But it is a fact, though, Russell, that when he was president, we experienced a blue-collar boom. That people that work with their hands, the muscular class, people that uh, shower before work and after work, saw the greatest increase in wages uh, and in their Weird. income levels. Uh, were there times when he was uh, doing too much for big corporations? Maybe, but I, I will say I'm more free market than not. We can have that discussion, Russell, um, where I, I do believe that one of the great fruits of Western society is the ability to, to trade and to have commerce and entrepreneurship with proper guardrails and, of course, a steadfast commitment rails? to the rule of law equally applied to all people, regardless of socioeconomic status. Uh, that, that is a bedrock principle of um, what we would call Western civilization, which comes out, of course, of Blackstone um, from your country. Again, thank you for all the wonderful things that uh, that the United Kingdom has given the world. But, you know, rule of law, due process, common custom, so all, all one of these here. wonderful things. But look, I will say this, that President Trump, the number one thing, Russell, that he would do to restore the American middle class is his stance on immigration. <laughs> So he's reading and leafing through a book while Charlie Kirk is talking. That's that's what he's doing. So if this is what it looks like when Russell is interested in what someone's saying, I'd love to see what he does when the boring Well, is he looking for like a quote or something? That would make no, sense no, so if he's like <laughs> trying to be half engaged and looking for something 
to so talk the, to, the, talk about. The, bo- the book he's picked up is by Winston Churchill. Um, so, so what's just happened is he was reminded by Charlie just before and couldn't help himself but pick it up and have a little leaf through. Um, you know, they're, they're, it, it's nothing to do with the thing that Charlie was talking about in terms of Churchill's work. <laughs> but uh, Maybe Russell thought he could find a, a smart thing to interject. Okay. Okay. That's what we'll I'm be- gonna I'm gonna give I'm gonna call it a push on this one just because and yeah we'll be it's, generous. it's not like an awesome look. Like making a podcast that you don't see is nicer. At least he wasn't like eating a sandwich. Like it's, it could be worse. It could definitely be worse. That is true. Um as for what Charlie Kirk was actually saying, uh right at the end there he was making the claim that the rule of law should be equally applied to all people, regardless of socioeconomic status, which I do agree with. Mm-hmm. But he's saying it just after saying that Trump is going through uh the equivalent of the Moscow show trials, um, and that there's no due process involved. Um, Um, The irony is so thick it's become a steel beam, the likes of which couldn't even be softened by burning jet fuel. Um, It's it's pretty outrageous. (laughs) Yeah, sheesh. Uh, mm. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Now, the the thing that Kirk finished off with there is saying that Trump is going to restore the middle class of America by tackling immigration. Uh, And I'm aware that probably sounds familiar to many of our American audience. Um, And so we might think we know where this is going. Um, But from Charlie Kirk, what I can guarantee is that he's going to take an extra step or two. Neil, the neoliberal project is based on three things, two of which can be easily said as invade the world, invite the world invade the world, invite the world. So President Trump, to his credit, no new wars. He, he was winding down the Afghanistan conflict. You know, he never would have allowed this Ukraine-Russian thing to go on. He criticized NATO. His instincts were right in that regard. Secondly, he, would, he had the border completely under control. He wants to try to put blue-collar middle-class workers first from an immigration-type policy mindset. So to answer your question is, yes, I I do believe that President Trump's policies are critical of this this kind of embedded belief system that is yet to be challenged in the post-World War II rules-based order, which really is just a permanent soft oligarchy that runs from Brussels to San Francisco. That's effectively what we live through, right? Where the the top 5% do super well and the the rest of the rest of the, the the west has to kind of struggle in barely owning property renting perpetually i think president trump in in the best case scenario will be able to permanently philosophically and politically change the default setting of neoliberalism in the west and in even a pretty good win he'll be able to close the border fix the immigration policies in the west end the ukraine war which would be a moral good for everybody involved including the united states And then finally, um, I think that from his economic policies, he wants to put tariffs on China and wants to protect American jobs manufacturing, which corporations hate and is uh, is a boon and is a uh, a terrific stimulus for what I call the muscular class, which you do not have a country if you do not have a muscular class. Mm. Is it just me who finds the term muscular class a bit gross and weird? Uh, you know, as, 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 as though the entire of the working class is like made up of like oiled, oiled up bodybuilders or something, you know? Well, it's just another um, like, what? Like, it's a, because fr- muscular Christianity is a thing that is kind of a trend, you know, like that's, that's, uh, which not less upsetting as a term, but like, yeah. it, it's like a term kind of like bouncing around the, again, it's like, the robot's input just was a little off. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, that's not exactly what we mean. Uh, Like, wait, a muscular class? It's the same as as describing them as the people who shower before and after work. I'm like, these are strange things to be saying about about a class of people. Yeah, it feels like he's got like an extended thesaurus just so he has, like, just so he likes, he has like more words to say the same thing, like blue collar, right? But if you try to make too many different words, you get weird. Like, (laughs) you know, and he's getting weird. 
you got two two adventurers. I mean, you know, it, it is. Um, I, I think it it is rooted in like a machismo kind of kind of thing, and I I think it does it does ultimately, um, you know, as you say, serve to uh, to offer the usual feigned reverence of the working class that the yeah. right wing always offers. Um, but specifically in this case, I would say that of working men. Um, uh, after all, you know, according to these traditional values types like Charlie Kirk here, um, women should be at home raising several children, children and baking pies and forgetting all of that silly independent stuff and anything that would require them having muscles. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of al almost a more, a more masculine centric, um, version of it, which don't like gotta say yeah like. which got bad news about traditional women's work by the way <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> how incredibly difficult and laborious virtually every task has always been yes absolutely back breaking yes, yes. absolutely um uh-huh anyway there, there was quite a bit packed into that clip uh so trump is going to fix the immigration policies of the entire west apparently um which does make it abundantly clear that all of kirk's talk about western values is actually just american values and he's yeah. just talking about America. When he says the West, it's America. That's what he actually means. Um, and there is also a soft oligarchy, which is a constant train running from Brussels to San Francisco. I mean, Brussels, I get, because that's where the EU sits. So there's, there's like, there's some claim of, you know, government kind of thing there. But San Francisco, you know, it's, 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 it's a left leaning city. Like, are the, are the EU funding the gays now? Is that what he's trying to tell me? Or vice versa? Are the gays funding the EU? In which what? case, uh, yeah. I, 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 I know I'm not fully gay, but I might owe some partial back taxes or something. Uh, well, but, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, is, does, is it like, is that close to Bohemian Grove? It's not. It's closer to LA. Oh, what are we? No. Yeah, that's, I mean. There's got to be something. There's definitely there's something. There's like, there's Silicon there's... Valley around there, but not exactly. Like, it's. There's, um. Do we just have uh, an there's, unawareness there's, there's of a, the geography a, of California? There's a, there's a, there's like, a, there's, <laughs> a, there's, a, there's a university, um, Berkeley. Is, is it that? Is it, it, could it be, could it be Berkeley? Um. Are we, we, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> I think mm. it's, maybe it's just one of those, like, De like demon in a, i live in a in in a evil hellhole sanctuary city of chicago so like i mm. mean maybe it's just yes again yeah, I th I th it's just I a thesaurus thing towards here. like well we can't it's... keep saying chicago we've said chicago too much so i'm start gonna start saying san francisco for a while before we like switch well, it's, it it's... up you know our, our um <sighs> our rogan our rogan episode you know he was he was bagging on san francisco then you know and 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 so clearly clearly that's become the new kind of focal point um, current of scapegoat these people. yeah yes exactly yeah. um at least for a little while yeah um, but doesn't stop it from striking the ear as weird <laughs> uh <laughs> as for uh the top five percent of people doing super well and the rest of the west struggling that is your system of free market capitalism doing what it's supposed to do you silly shit go mm. back to college like that's it's it's the whole thing run run to its conclusion that's where we are at um almost Ugh. um and kirk's main point uh the main takeaway here is what he set up top right which is invade the world invite the world and he's going to expand on that shortly so i won't get into it properly right this second but that is his main idea of what is apparently the large part of the neoliberal project um anyway russell's put the book down long enough to ask another question I love your point about um, invite the world, invade the world, invite the world. And I wonder if you believe, as I do, that if you are to be a nativist, if you are to be about your nation's interests and everyone in that nation, regardless of their race, regardless of their creed, regardless of their religion, even though I'm sure all of us have our preferences when it comes to religion and culture, etc., that that m at some point, if it is decreed by referendum, then control of uh, borders is something that has to be accepted but would you say that you know if if invite the invade the world invite the world is the problem is the solution stop invading the world stop inviting the world and you can't have one without the other yes i, I think that in the current setting absolutely I, I think that the current the current life source of the imperial capital which we call washington dc is is the is every nine months they need another country where they're dropping bombs or another you know regime change type of effort and president trump again i, I don't want to make this too much about trump but i will say to his credit there were no new wars and he resisted uh. interventions in venezuela iran many other places 
And the so so why is that? I mean, it is it is a hallmark characteristic of a dying regime to care far more about abstractions abroad than the immediate concerns of your citizens. Mm. Um. So first, I mean, Trump wanted to bomb Iran so he could try and stay in office. Yeah. Uh, just, yeah. Just, yeah. He really wanted to. Throwing that out there, he really wanted to. Uh, <laughs> um. But, but Kurt keeps hopping on like, about this. No, not for was. lack of trying. Not for lack exactly. of trying. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see some sources on, on and, and some further explanation of what he's saying at the end there. It's the hallmark of a dying regime to care more about abstractions abroad than the immediate concerns of your citizens. They're I also mean, like they're they're really like and in recent months, maybe or maybe last year, like or I've just heard it more recently that like they're really hammering home the manufacturing consent kind of like. Which like time and place, great point. This like they're they're mm. using it's another like kind of culturally aware like 1984, like you know, like invoking all the Huxley's. Like you're taking mm. the language of manufacturing consent and then kind of like mm, we're gonna bend it here and shift it there and and mm -hmm. weep wop whoop and and you know maybe get out the country crock and grease it to fit like that. That's very. Like the, it's it's another thing I've heard a lot um, recently of kind of just just ooh just just scooching that kind of like those those words and phrases into their needs, taking I think maybe a more left kind of like argument approach you know analysis someone that was you know kind of like on the left and then just kind of like they would do with. Fucking 1984, or whatever is like, and, yeah, yeah, and just scooching absolutely. the idea over to what they need to serve their purpose. Yeah, yeah, and kind of bastardizing it to the point where it 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 almost no longer means the thing that it used to mean. Oh, yeah. um, in yeah. terms of how yeah. they're using it, yeah, and it, it's it's very it's very much kind of following the narrative of of, of being against foreign aid of any sort. Right. Um, you know, like oh, why are we spending this money? You know, intervening in other countries. You know, and and it's uh, okay. <laughs> Oh, for our own um, selfish reasons. We all have selfish yeah. reasons. Those should even yeah. be enough. Like just doing it the right way, selfishly, like selfish long term reasons mm. would mm. honestly bear out a lot of the same conclusions as the short, but like it's because it's short term, it, mm. it's like immediate goals. And that's why there it things seem so short sighted. Like foreign affairs seem so short sighted because like they totally are. Yes. Which, which yes, is a they are. fucking problem. <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, in any case, what we just heard was Russell very much signing on to the concept of invade the world, invite the world, um, stoking nativism and saying that, yeah, we should all be fine with tight border and immigration controls. Um, when viewed through the specific lens that this guy wants us all to live in tiny theocratic ethno states, it's not overly surprising. Uh, but it is surprising that he's quite casually just saying it out loud these days with 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 nary a concern in the world <laughs> um that that was not the case when we started this project that's for yeah sure. <laughs> yeah it's weird it's um man oh man it sounds like mm. I, and i think i think that so alex jones benefited from this for a while um but then kind of ruined it was that he was trying to position himself as like being critical of trump because mm. and, and now Alex kind of painted himself into a corner, and, uh, and other pundits as well have kind of like painted themselves into a corner. I think Tucker probably like of you're a supporter, like you are you're you're on Trump's team, like you're you're yeah. pro Trump. Whereas um, what we can see through their own development is being like still being critical of Trump because like their chats, their you know like their their listener base mm. is is not so thrilled with how Trump uh, the exact thing that um, that Russell brought up which is like he's the one that made the vaccine you know like that's they're they're like his own ba a, a portion of his own base turned against him because of the vaccine and yeah. so or at least is is on the fence and is very uncomfortable by being reminded that oh the vaccine was actually a trump deal like that kind of um i'm i'm wonder like so that being able to have the wiggle room to be critical uh works extremely well for Russell talking to his base, responding to his, um, you know, his chat, his local channel. And mm. I think like, it seems like testing, like we're not necessarily like learning or talking about anything real here. He's testing these talking points of like, 
if anybody is going to tell me what to how to answer my um my listeners my followers my chat like if anyone is going to have the stock talking points that we're going to agree on is Charlie Kirk. Charlie mm. Kirk is the one. It's like okay so these are the questions I'm getting tell me how to answer them in a way that can rationalize and stay on topic because it feels like mm. the fact that Russell's having all these same like so different uh, these like guests that are so far afield from his brand even a year ago like are mm. we going to see Steve Bannon are we going to see Stephen Cry are we going to see Roger Stone like these are very different in which you're, you've observed and explained like why we have these kind of um guest specific episodes it's like the episode like I never ever expected to see Charlie Kirk mm. I didn't yeah I just yeah. didn't this is this is for me. This is extreme, and I yeah. wonder if he's just like, okay, this is how we get into the fold and get the clout and get the market, you know, like the yeah, the yeah. share, you know. Um, yeah, I, 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 at this point, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Steve Bannon came on the show. Um, he did a thing with Crowder when he first joined Rumble. Um, so, so that that has occurred. Haven't seen him since, which is interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so at this point, I don't know. I, I feel like you know, when when you get to the Charlie Kirk point, kind of all bets are off, pretty much. Right. <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. it, it's um, we're, a dam broke with the, like there's which I didn't think I was going to see like w when we started this, like, it's just interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And cause it, I, I, you know, this is all, it's all like influencer, like everybody's just selling each other's makeup palettes, like at the end of the day, yeah, yeah like truly. And so are we getting the Jeffree star makeup palette deal? Is that like, is that what we're gunning for? Is it like, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it, it to have all the right people on your channel because I same thing um, came up last week. You know what I mean? Like they're making the rounds and I Yeah, and I I do think we can pinpoint the exact moment that the dam broke. Um and that was uh, sometime in September of last year. Um right. it's funny funny how that's that's exactly coincidentally when that when that seemed to happen. Um now in the next clip, Charlie expands on his idea of invade the world, invite the world, which goes in a slightly unexpected and deeply unpleasant direction. And then in a way that might be economically beneficial to the American ruling class, or it might be politically useful, not only do they want to go break stuff and really kill hundreds of thousands of people in far off distant lands, but then as a way I think it makes themselves feel better than they want to bring them back to the country that they're supposed to govern. And that, that is bad for everyone involved. And I'll just use one example of a lesser reported. We all, in, the, in America, we all know the, the movie Black Hawk Down, maybe you know it or not. Uh, it was all about the uh, failed evacuation efforts in Mogadishu, Somalia uh, under Bill Clinton. And a helicopter goes down and there was a huge firefight. And so we were involved in Somalia. It wasn't a war, but it was another kind of one of our half wars, right? Uh, similar to like Gaddafi and Libya. We we're kind of nope. like half in, half out, which I never liked that because like being half pregnant, it's either you go to war or you don't, nope. right? Uh, it, it, th that kind of spectrum is, has always been puzzling to me. But then we get really involved there. And next thing you know, we start importing tens of thousands, soon to be hundreds of thousands of Somalians into our country. And they have not assimilated well. And one of the most uh, repulsive members of our government is Elon Omar, who never says a nice thing about the United States of America. And she's a radical left wing. I, I don't even mean that. I don't want to make it too political in that sense. She's just like a revolutionary type where she wants mass immigration. And she has she is not, in my personal opinion, loyal to the United States. But that's the project is that you invade, you get involved in certain um, disputes, and then you invite the people that you might have um, unsettled or that you have displaced. And not just in that area, we have over 120 countries coming across our southern border right now. In America, we have 15,000 people a day marching into our country. We don't know where they're from, but we have some idea where they're from. We don't know their background. We don't know they're connected, who they're connected to. What, is he imagining that they're all part of some shadowy army or something? Like an extension of the secret intelligentsia? Um, <laughs> we don't know who, who they're connected to. Okay. Um, well, that talking so the, the, point, that complete mischaracterization of of um, migrants is like mm. very 
on brand and completely fucking off the wall for yeah conservative kind of talking heads like him. Absolutely. Um. So Jesus. so that that fifteen thousand immigrants a day figure felt high to me. Um. So you know took a look into it. And it is possible that there have been some days within the last year that have seen 15,000 people enter the US with the intention of staying. Um, which is to say, at its peak at the Texas border, there were reportedly around 10,000 people crossing in a single day. Um, factor in other ways of people entering the country as well, and I could see the number possibly hitting 15,000 at its peak. Maybe. Fine. But the way Charlie is presenting it is as though that's a daily occurrence happening every single day. Um, so, according to an estimate from the Census Bureau, 1.1 million immigrants came to the US in 2023. That averages out to 3,000 immigrants a day, which seems a bit more accurate. Um, and e even if you were to say, oh, the Census Bureau, they're terrible with numbers, those people, they fudged it. O okay, then, let's double the figure, say it was 2.2 million, that's still only an average of 6,000 immigrants per day, which is nowhere near close to 15,000. Um, in fact, if that 15,000 figure were accurate and consistent, the number of immigrants in the US would be increasing at a rate of 5.5 million per year, which I think people would notice. Uh, just just a hunch. Yeah. Uh, well, right. That's like, I mean, who do you think is going to mow your lawn, make your food? I'm saying Charlie Kirk, right? You. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Who's going to mm -hmm. clean your house, like clean your hotel rooms, care yeah. for your elderly? Like yeah. who's going to like, again, plant your hedges, whatever. You're not going to. Uh, the, the, the demonization yeah. of like this kind of migrant influx is so fucking off the wall and crazy it doesn't work mm -hmm. on like any level it's so it's genuinely like it is hard for me to hear in a very special way where like mm. oh i'm i don't benefit from that influx of labor in this i mean i do because i eat food but yeah. um in the direct way that like I know who walks your dogs. I know who take again, like I know who takes care of your grandparents. Mm. Like come on. Like what are we mm, uh, it's just yeah, it's yeah. so and, 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 evil. You know, more than more than two thirds of immigrants in the in the US are, you know, documented immigrants. And and yeah. um <laughs> and most of the people coming across the southern border are are, you know, they're they're seeking asylum. They're, they're <laughs> Like a, a huge, huge swaths of them are not, they're not economic migrants. They're, they're, they are leaving harrowing situations in their home country. That are um, very usually like, fuck it. Like, again, I don't disagree the way that he said, like, it's a half war or whatever, being half pregnant. Again, we'll, we'll weird. get to that in a second. But we'll right. Yeah. But like, yeah, no, yeah. we, we make messes and don't clean them up. Our country does. The, this is the thing. He's, right. He is um, he is striking on something that that has a degree of truth to it. Right. Um, well, then let's just the one thing I did hear that was like, again, the robot glitched and said the wrong thing was he said break stuff when I think he was talking about move fast, break things, which was the Mark Zuckerberg Facebook quote. Uh, right, break yeah, stuff yeah. is a little more limp biscuit if you're yes. asking my <laughs> cultural kind of exposure. But yeah, I think that yeah. conservatives also, and I feel like Charlie Kirk is an, is a very interesting microcosm in a specific way of like the conservative like bubble makes you a weird culture robot. Like you don't mm. really, since you aren't allowed to engage with this heathen culture, you should only mm. be watching like Dove films, you know. Oh, and Mr. Bean, right? Because he doesn't say yes. anything, even though he's incredibly evil. Uh, but he's safe for Christian kids because he doesn't say words. So like that kind mm. of, you know, like that, that like, you're out, you're in the world, like, and not of the world. And so that makes you say yeah. shit like a weird glitchy robot. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, that that could be the, um, it, it could be a Limp Bizkit thing just accidentally creeping in well, there. Well, I mean, which, it sounds like is, you just could, got be fun. move fast, be break fun. stuff wrong. And like, that, I mean, I, I will say, I, will I have say, a complaint like, about that as well. You know, the, 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 there is merit to the idea of, of sending Fred Durst instead of military intervention. I'm like, send Fred Durst, see if he can figure it out. You know, maybe, maybe that'll, maybe he's an excellent diplomat. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna bet uh, no. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, anyway, so. 
Ilhan Omar is apparently disloyal to the United States, so that's great. Um, I wonder if it's got anything to do with her being brown, female, or Muslim. Uh, in any case, uh, Charlie Kirk is using her as apparently a prime example of how his Invade the World, Invite the World theory works, citing the movie Black Hawk Down as his source. Um, Charlie, go back to college and you might actually understand what happened. So, so in, in, in 1992, there was a UN resolution that aimed to halt widespread starvation with the continent of Africa being a key target. Um, thus began Operation Restore Hope, a US initiative to support that resolution. The idea was to secure trade routes so food could get to Somalis. Uh, the UN estimated, by the way, that no fewer than 250,000 lives were saved through this effort. Um, so there is merit there. Um, however, Almost right away, militias led by the Somali warlord Mohamed Farah Idid um, began attacking and killing UN peacekeepers. Um, see, there was a little bit of a, of a civil war type situation mm. going on. Uh, the US then set in motion a mission to arrest two of Idid's lieutenants. Um, but, you know, best laid plans of mice and men often go awry and unexpectedly local militias got involved, which led to two Black Hawk helicopters being downed by RPGs, uh, at which point roughly 90 US Rangers and Delta Force members uh, rushed in to rescue them, and then what followed was an 18-hour urban firefight later dubbed the Battle of Mogadishu. Um, 18 Americans were killed and hundreds of Somalis were killed. Uh, it was a colossal fuck-up which severely exacerbated the civil war in Somalia over the coming years, mm -hmm. uh, and according to many, this, uh, this event led to the US not intervening intervening in the Rwandan genocide or the Bosnian genocide for fear of, you know, essentially doing the same thing and making it worse. All of this is Which to say... Um, I mean, mm, well, you know, I mean... Uh, yeah, it, it, very difficult to say, even in hindsight, I think. Um, all of this to say, the situation described as above is not particularly comparable to the US and other allied forces like the UK, Canada, and France bombing the living shit out of Libya from the skies during the civil war to oust Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. Um, you yeah. know, they're, they're very different situations. Um, nonetheless, according to Charlie Kirk, because the US was in any way involved in Somalia, militarily that counts as invade the world and therefore invite the world what's interesting here is of course that he is seizing on a very real phenomenon as you've mentioned which is that when a country has been invaded with an imperialist mission of colonization or otherwise the people of that country that's been invaded tend to want to go to whichever country has invaded theirs this can be for many reasons but in simple terms if you go somewhere destroy people's homes and degrade the people who live there while also telling them just how fantastic your country is they might be inclined to make the journey um, there is a reason that the UK has high populations of immigrants from countries that were once part of the British Empire. You know, it's it's not a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, they walk around being like, we will save you. We're saving you. Mission accomplished yeah. banner. Like that's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's a tacit in, like that's that's a tacit agreement. Almost. Yes, yes, it is. You know? Um the difference with how Charlie Kirk is putting it, however, is that he's insinuating a grand conspiracy, which is supposedly the mission of the neoliberal project, um, in that clearly the secret intelligentsia or whoever are actively trying to get involved in armed conflicts worldwide to then bring more immigrants from those countries into the US, who will then be disloyal to the US like Ilhan Omar is, apparently. Um, and this does, of course, tie neatly into the great replacement theory narrative that the whites are all being replaced and watered down by brown people. Um, so that's that's delightful. Um, I do oh, I do also want to say that along with many of his contemporaries, because um, he's, he's used this phrase a lot so far and it's it's irking me. Um, I don't think Charlie Kirk knows what neoliberalism is. No. Uh, and I say this because by any reasonable definition, Charlie Kirk is a neoliberal. The the definition states 
Neoliberalism is contemporarily used to refer to market-oriented reform policies such as eliminating price controls, deregulating capital markets, lowering trade barriers, and reducing, especially through privatization and austerity, state influence in the economy. It's particularly a way to implement free market policies with reckless abandon, which is what Charlie Kirk is all about. But because the word has liberal in it, it must be bad and mean left, and it has neo in it, so it must in fact mean modern, so it's the modern liberal or the modern left, according to this fucking idiot. Again, Charlie, go back to college. Um, oh, yeah. It, it, it bugs me, and it's a, well, it's just a frequent don't use, problem. Yeah, just don't, Black Hawk Down isn't a documentary. Like, it's also it, that. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not a rain camera. It's not rain camera footage, everybody. Hate to break no, it to no, you. No, no, no. And, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's based on a book that, that is, you know, a, an account of what happened, but again, not a documentary, right? Well, even the person, like, <sighs> it, it's, it's, it's removed from there, there it's, is, it's cinema. There are many, many steps of edi editorializing, right? <laughs> and I have, I, I always have to at least point out that when they're conflating, you know, like they're complaining narrative and fiction with nonfiction, and it, it can look le a lot like nonfiction, but that doesn't. It's still a movie. Um, yep. And also, you, like again, you don't have to read about. You don't like. There's plenty of like military people out there that have excellent critiques that could take you 20 minutes to listen to. It's really Absolutely. not even that complicated. Like he has mm. no excuse to not at least be educated on this. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. or whatever. Like, I, I don't know. It's using a talking point. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't like it. Um, yeah, so yeah, from yeah. here, yeah. we we get a story from Charlie about Winston Churchill, and 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 we start to pivot in in another terrible direction. <laughs> That point on technology and tyranny, Russell, if I may, I want to make one other point, and it's a great a great anecdote. Um, uh, Churchill talks about the first time he saw the machine gun and what that what that did to him. And I don't remember, I think it was the Darvishes, I could have this wrong, uh, but it was some sort of uh, an African proxy conflict. Boer War. And it was the, yeah, yeah okay, the Boer, Boer War. War, thank you. And so, so you know this anecdote, and no. I, I don't need to- uh, No, do it, belabor, do it. But, uh, and so essentially, there were these incredibly courageous um, warriors of the indigenous people of the country they were fighting in. And they hyped themselves up and they were they went through all of their pre uh, battle rituals and ceremonies and they charge into battle and England or the United Kingdom just turns on the machine gun and mows them down. And Churchill writes in his private diaries that was the first time where valor, courage, heroism meant far less than technology and sophistication. And it bothered him for basically the rest of his life. He wrote about this all the time where he's like war has completely changed. It's not about how bad you want it. It's not about, you know, are you willing, like the whole Braveheart scene, right? Where, you know, one Scot can take on, you know, 10 soldiers of the, the English army. No, it's just about who has the more sophisticated weaponry. And then he talked about what does that mean then for the state and how that could potentially destroy people's freedoms. And so that's one of my favorite topics to explore because we're really now at the intersection of technology and tyranny, a mass surveillance state, um, overly medicating the the people. We are the most medicated population in the history of the planet in the West, the most suicidal, the most anxious, the most depressed, uh, the least happy. Um, and I, I think a lot of these things are connected, which is have these technologies actually made us better versions of ourselves? Are we flourishing? And I'm more in the in the direction of no. I actually think these technologies that were supposed to liberate us are actually the handcuffs that are not keeping us free. I think this is the first time I've heard someone invoke Winston Churchill to try and tell me that Western medicine is bad. Um, and and spe specifically, you know, when you drill down on these people about what medicine is bad, they settle on SSRIs and antidepressants in general, right? So so he's using about a story. He's using a story about Winston Churchill being supposedly horrified at the destruction a machine gun can cause to tell us that SSRIs are bad and and is is part of technology being a tool of oppression. Uh, well. Also, yes, and hmm. Hmm. I'm going to even en like I'm going to engage with Charlie Kirk on his own terms. Like, hmm. here's my issue: hmm. Churchill should have known already about military technology. Literally, since the time of King Nebuchadnezzar, 
<laughs> and before <laughs> is like if yeah. you know anything about history and if you have any fucking intellectual goddamn curiosity about the human condition in your bones any one cell in your body learning mm. about history and understanding that like technological um like technical technological superiority and like and resource allocation is exactly what has shaped this world and military history if you have yep. and if you're an intellectually curious person yeah yeah that 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 does seem to be a requirement that um china yeah. might be lacking in yeah. um yeah further let me tell I'm, you about happy... arrows dog crazy yeah right crazy. right <laughs> I, I I am happy to be proven wrong on this from someone who knows more than me, um, because, you know, Churchill did write quite a lot, but I could find no evidence of him being haunted by the advent of the machine gun, and, and particularly its use in the Boer War. Um, in fact, upon reading his account of his involvement in the Boer War in South Africa, uh, Churchill seemed to bloody love machine guns and thought they were just terrific at mowing the enemy down. That sounds more uh, accurate as well. It does. Uh, uh, quote, Boer on the skyline at 2,000 yards, tat, 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 half a dozen times repeated, boars galloping to cover, one, yes, by Jupiter, one on his back in the grass, after that, no more targets to shoot at. Um, and from further on, uh, these three machines set up in a most exhilarating splutter, flaring and crackling all along the edge of the wood. Unquote. <laughs> yeah, he sounds haunted. Uh <laughs> hates it <laughs> even if they get to the point of being haunted and they talk about it in their journals like and write yeah. letters to their friends about it a la thomas mm. jefferson and slavery mm. you can be as you can be as pressed about it in your in your alone time as you want mm. if you're not gonna do anything about it while you're in your place of power you can sit and fucking spin my guy i don't give a single solitary shit that's also why I like hearing y the quote that you just read oh well that mm. rings a lot more true with like what happened <laughs> mm. just yeah man oh Feels man like it, it lines up just a little more yeah. a little more accurately with with churchill as a human being yeah. um Oh dear. Yeah, I get the distinct feeling Charlie may have gotten this revisionist perspective fed to him, um, possibly by someone like Larry Arn. Um, yeah, and he's uh, just giving very John Birch society. Like this is, I feel like mm. Charlie Kirk is is like another, not just you know that what I referenced earlier as far as is like far right and like you know even like KKK dudes um, mm. in politics allowed to be in politics, but like just it's he's he the legacy of the john birch society is exactly what he's like those are the steps that he's following i think i feel yeah that's yeah 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 a lot of the in, same in, stuff yeah in, in a very kind of um polished and presentable kind of way um, yeah which to, was always his, the plan to his audience yes indeed um anyway Back on the subject of medicine being bad, um, after a bit of a bramble, Russell asks uh, what is a fairly decent question about libertarianism? Yeah, I uh, generally agree with that. If we, uh, you, like me, feel that there is a necessity for minimal intervention from any authoritative force, whether that's a state force or some kind of corporate power that acts as its proxy, whether directly through the imposition of legislature or just through the sheer scale of its influence, the kind of soft power that can be exerted through the, uh, the globalist corporation that ultimately I consider to be using the veil of America to conduct their globalist projects. How would you, if you, if you do believe in small government, be able to reduce the impact of, for example, the pharmaceutical industry, mentioning, as you just did, the, uh, the, you know, the sort of health crisis that they've facilitated, induced? What would you be able to do about big food's oh. ability to ensure that people live uh, uh, on diets, uh, essentially giving them diet, heart, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer without an yes. interventionist state how do you control the power of major corporations and their negative impact on the american population and the world population boy that that's a huge topic that is a huge topic russell what are you doing we're supposed to be complaining about these things not providing solutions to these things that's someone else's job i'm supposed to come on here and whinge not come up with ideas <laughs> <laughs> He's looking for his talking points. He's like, I don't, I don't know how to address this. Maybe even with myself. Yeah, yeah. Here's or a hole. <laughs> my, yeah, please fill it. <laughs> give me, give me some, give me some of the goods. 
Yeah, yeah, and I, like because I do think the question is a good one because it, it does confront the fact that libertarianism and neoliberalism, both by their very nature, just allow the free market to do whatever the shit it wants without any guardrails. So, how would you regulate industries that need regulation without government intervention? Um, it's, it's, it's a tough That's one like, to answer. I wrote this in a little bit earlier, but like the, Trump bringing jobs because the whole like coal miner, blue collar, like using working Americans as mm. a set piece, as literal mm. pawns on a board that mean absolutely fucking nothing to them. Mm -hmm. They don't give a single solitary shit about the safety or dignity in the lives of a worker. For sure. I feel like that's been proven. Somehow I had to keep saying it. But like, mm -hmm. how would Trump bring jobs without intense very like serious regulations like strict mm. like not not they wouldn't be staying free these corporations to force that because they also were sold a bill of goods from trump and conservatives about keeping jobs like keeping manufacturing jobs in america mm. the government didn't do what they needed to, like the government facilitated jobs leaving they're not coming mm -hmm. back that's that fantasy that's being sold still it's amazing to me that the that fantasy is still being sold to the american people that they're gonna bring menu like solid manufacturing jobs back mm. baby that's not happening it's nope. not gonna fucking happen and nope. because you, you that would you, you would need to even even the way that um I, Maybe they would make the argument, and I'm trying to just like devil's advocate or at least try to entertain this thought that like eminent domain and, you know, like strict like or, or just or um exploiting, you know, like a local government process through, mm. you know, like exceptions, especially with like tax breaks. That's the one thing that like is has been at the feet of every single city council that I've been hearing over and over citizens that are getting fucking ignored of these like gigantic tax incentives and like money is being spent our money our city's money is being spent and then like just feeding into money pits of like oh well we're going to incentivize and we're going to make our our cities desirable for these corporations and that's mm. how we make the jobs without controlling anything when oh actually no you are making massive changes to the, like you are making insurmountable Effect, like impacts on the budget of my city you are yep. changing laws you are exploiting loopholes you are like you are doing all of these like heavily like just uh, big government the biggest government the biggest yeah. hand of the government huge, is required huge, huge tax breaks to billion dollar corporations you know <laughs> exactly which are like we're now living in this like this was these like big ideas of job creators to just gouge the city and now we're living in this kind of like post tax like corporate tax break boom mm. and now we're like now again like it's coming up at every fucking city council like any any like you know creators got like some kind of local effort it's about like please stop ruining our cities by gutting us so you can have nike here please stop like, mm. yes, the Nike campus looks good. The rest of the city is crumbling around it. Please fucking stop doing this and stop using our money to pay your friends. Like it's because it, it's we're in, we're it has grown to a level that we we drive over every day, you know, like we are yep. try to drive over every day. Like, yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's it's it's. Do you it, it, and it's exactly what Russell's saying is like, well, don't we need intense intricate labyrinthine regulations for the thing that you're asking for mm. which is exact i was thinking the same thing or like i was like how how would trump bring like bring jobs yeah, yeah. make jobs well, well, want jobs do jobs mm. e exactly so, so so this is the question right how would you regulate industries that do require regulation without government intervention and let's let's hear charlie's answer right well first of all I think it needs to start with the people and shows like this. We need to talk openly about the benefits of eating clean and rejecting high fructose corn syrup and not 
not engage, not eating foods that are highly pro ultra processed and eating whole foods. I think that we need to continue to talk about that from a bottom up cultural perspective. But as far as the government, uh, and I say this in, in, in America, we have this very bizarre allowance for pharmaceutical companies to advertise. I say this as a small government guy. Yeah. It should not be allowed. Pharmaceutical yeah. companies should not be able to run endless advertisements sure. and be able to buy our news company, media companies. Uh, that needs to be ended. And you saw, I'm sure, the video brought to you by Pfizer, brought to you by Pfizer. I mean, they literally purchase airtime on the mainstream networks. Okay. That last part we can agree with. Pharmaceutical yeah. advertising is weird and fucked up, and there's a reason it's illegal almost everywhere. Yeah. Um, not, not quite sure how it solves the problem of regulating the pharmaceutical companies who do require regulation um, without government intervention, but fine, sure, I, I agree with the point he's making. Um, the first part, however, the way to address food-related issues is apparently talking about them, because no one talks about food these days, um, uh, of avoiding high fructose corn syrups, because, I mean, you can't ban them or get rid of them or anything, because that would be government intervention, so avoid them, and start eating whole foods and unprocessed foods. Lauren, you actually live in the US, so I'm sure you can answer this. Over there, is it more or less expensive to eat unprocessed whole foods compared to processed foods? Oh, it's, yeah, it's way more expensive to eat. Way more the expensive. Way that he's describing. Hmm. Yeah. And when, when was the last time the minimum wage was raised? About 15 years ago. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's still seven. Okay. It's still like seven twenty five, seven dollars and yeah. 25 cents an mm. hour federally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. See, um, but let's ban TikTok, two, right? <laughs> let's ban TikTok. So, so those two things combined kind of, um, well, you see my problem, right? <laughs> Again, we, what we have here is two incredibly wealthy individuals telling us how we should all live. Uh, Russell, as previously mentioned, has a net worth of at least $20 million, and I'd wager it being a lot higher in reality. And Charlie Kirk has a net worth somewhere between 5 and $22 million, depending on who you ask. But I know for sure that his salary at Turning Point USA uh, alone in 2021 was $407,000. Um, and no doubt, no doubt it's gone up since then. And, and that puts both of these white men in the top zero. 0.01% wealthiest people alive today. Um, so, yeah, not, not, not a wonder that they don't understand how the problem is not solvable by, oh, just eat, eat vegetables that haven't been processed. Ugh. Well, if that's their position, then obviously they're, they're supporting legislation about um, curtailing food waste in America because it's a gigantic fucking problem and it absolutely has to do, is tied with uh, class and access and money. So, right? I mean, that's what that, they're going to talk but, about next well, is but, regulating... But that, the that would disposal be, um, of uh, perfectly good food and for the sake of capital, for the sake of profit, they're going to talk would about be, that, right? That, that would be big government, I'm afraid. I'm familiar uh, yeah. with a lot of legislation that, that yeah. people are on the grassroots level. Like they could use, they could use this platform. Um, ah, it's right? big government. What, what, so that's what, what they're going to do? do? Well, no? it's, it's big government. Nah, I can't, can't, can't. Um, it's, it's too big, too big. Mm -hmm. Tax breaks, fine. Doing that, no. Um, <laughs> Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, too hmm. big, too big. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, and and this is this is without even fucking addressing the the concept of food deserts and and all the other fucking things surrounding this issue that that um, that make these two ding dongs um, entirely irrelevant, uh, <laughs> and the things that they say. Good lord. Um, now from here, somewhat predictably, we pivot into some anti-vax shit. Ronald Reagan made a massive mistake. Ronald Reagan effectively indemnified the vaccine manufacturers in America that said they were not allowed to be held criminally or civilly liable for the injuries that vaccines uh, do to children or to adults. And so effectively what happened, and this is how it works in the States, and I don't know if it's similar in, in the United Kingdom, where yeah. let's say that you get uh, a measles, mumps, and rubella shot, and you go into a seizure which happens more than people ever want to acknowledge. I, I'm not anti-vax. I'm just saying this is a fact, okay? The way it works is then you fill out a form. It's called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, and all hey. the claims are funded by the taxpayer. So the vaccine companies never have to touch it. So they have no liability. So I want you to imagine that you're a multi-billion, multi-hundred billion dollar enterprise, and you have no check and balance from the consumer. We wouldn't tolerate this with airlines, with 
banks, uh, with credit card well, companies. Again, there's a little bit of moral hazard. We bail out those companies far too often, but just from a small government perspective, we have left. created a big government protection racket of the biggest companies that never have to answer for their products potentially harming the consumers. Now, the reason they passed it, Russell, was they, well, we need to increase our vaccination rates and we need to protect these companies. And my answer is, but if the product itself is truly safe and effective, then you shouldn't be afraid of the claims that are coming after you in court. Then, right. then fine, you know, little Johnny's in a wheelchair. Did your vaccine do that or did it not do that? And pay the claim or fight it in court. And so there's this protection racket that nobody wants to touch, which is basically immunity for the four big manufacturers. The, the two biggest in America are Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson. They basically run the American Pharmaceutical Project. And if right now I went and got a COVID shot and all of a sudden I dropped dead or if I had you know, lasting forbid. health effects, I cannot see Pfizer in court. At this moment, now there's there's a little workarounds that people like Dell Bigtree and others are trying to be able to finally get them to be able to held accountable. But so to answer your question, Russ, what would I do? The first thing I would do is I would say you no longer get special taxpayer funded protection as a pharmaceutical company. Yeah, that's a good move. I agree with you on so many issues. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> Even Russell did a <laughs> like. At the yep. same time we did. If yep. you're not watching, we all went <laughs> at the same Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, we all had a little chuckle to ourselves at what uh, at what Charlie Boy was saying. Um so so real quick before I uh, get into it, the the um uh seizures from the MMR vaccine um situation. That that that's uh, that's an occurrence of um one in every thousand. Um so you know more often than than people like to talk about sure whatever um you know i mean i mean you know, my 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 daughter just got the mmr vaccine just the other day um anyway measles is ripping through chicago right now by the way dope okay great yeah that seems like a yeah. good time to talk about that cheers charlie um so right here, here's the thing if you got a vaccine of any kind and then had a health issue that was listed in the potential side effects of receiving said vaccine how difficult do you think it would be to conclusively prove in a court of law that it was the vaccine which caused the health issue? Because to my mind, it would be a very fucking difficult thing to do in terms of legal kind of burden of proof, right? Um, and yet, according to Charlie Kirk's methodology here, a small government system of free market capitalism running amok would work because people would be able to sue vaccine manufacturers. It's like, well, that's that's clearly not a feasible kind of situation for so many reasons. And there are many reasons that for for certain vaccines, the manufacturers are not held legally responsible. It's not for all vaccines, by the way. Um, and, and most of it does come down to public safety and the verifiable need to have these vaccines manufactured. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're just happy to put whatever the fuck in them and then everyone dies. Like if, if there are public health concerns with vaccines, they are prevented from distribution or only allowed to, or they get recalled, or only allowed to certain segments of the population much like Johnson & Johnson or the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine, both of which have had their distribution to certain portions of the population hampered because of side effects, um, which means they in turn make less money from the product. Is that what they want? Absolutely not. Their motive is to make it as safe as possible for any and all humans, not just for public health, but also for profit in the free market system, that thing you love so much, Charlie. And of course, the reality is that just because we can't sue Pfizer, it doesn't mean they're just allowed to do whatever the fuck they want. These industries are regulated. These vaccines are checked and triple checked by the government on behalf of the people. The only way that system falls apart is if you become libertarian or neoliberal like Charlie Kirk and start suggesting deregulation and small government is the fucking way to go. It's mm. th the very system is <laughs> to prevent lawsuits. <laughs> Because you can still sue Pfizer, people do it yeah. all the time. Yeah, for sure. The VARES, sure. I feel like we've talked, we've covered the VARES. Yeah, thing yeah. Before, I mean, right? feel, yeah, feel, yeah, yeah, feel, yeah, yeah. We 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 have, but you know, feel feel. Free well, I mean, it's it feels like it's. Uh, 
I'm exhausted it, it, by it did kind arguing of, it's, about it's, it. It's been yeah, four years it's, now where I yeah. learned about it a lot. I learned mm-hmm. detail I never thought I'd have to, and now I do, and I don't didn't consent, and now I have mm-hmm. to know about it. And uh, yeah. I again, just like CRT, as soon as people started, like as soon as conservative fucking talking heads started using this as a cudgel um and as a talking point and spinning a narrative about it i learned about it immediately and i was like huh that's not what they're saying and i still have to hear about it i uh yeah i i'm sick of this i'm this i'm sick of it i'm fucking yeah. sick of it because it's yeah. it's yeah it's like a good thing and you can sue pfizer you can try sure. i mean you know that okay Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, and instead, we're all going to get polio and measles. Um, fantastic times we live in. Right. Uh, well, and parts uh, of Chicago, obviously, ripping through. I was being, you know, I was, I was being a little extra. It's more that I'm just like scared for kids. Like it's just, yeah, yeah. I'm so yeah, maybe so maybe like that sounded extreme. It's my that reflects my feelings about it because it's so fucking preventable. It's so avoidable, and. Yeah. I'm not a person that necessarily, you know, yeah, I got my vaccines as a kid. And VAERS is there for parents, for people that are hurt. Like there's, that's, it's a great thing that we have to support people with, um, you know, they don't have to sue to get the help that they might need. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, yeah. it's a net positive. Yeah. It's like a good it, it, exactly. thing. Exactly. R- rather than attempting, you know, what, what would be an incredible uphill legal battle that, yeah. that would be nearly impossible to try and actually litigate. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Oh, it's leveling dear. the playing field between a gigantic corporation or a couple of gigantic corporations and regular people. They're That's trying. The yeah. 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 Uh, now, Russell has a rare moment of introspection um, here on his show before asking Charlie Kirk yet another tough question on Trump. Or, t- I mean, tough for, for their media sphere anyway. He's having a smart day I today. feel I just want to yeah. briefly mention, because I, in, I think attempting to try to create conviviality, congeniality, and the necessary solidarity that I believe voices from the periphery have to achieve in order to meaningfully challenge the establishment, fail to mention uh, the significant fact that it was Trump that pushed for prosecution of Julian Assange uh, under the Espionage Act and did not pardon Assange when he left office. And it's like these kind of omissions that uh, uh, trouble me, even though it is plain to see for anybody that the establishment, whether you mean the leg, whether you mean the legacy media, big pharma, the military industrial complex, uh, and of course, the, the uh, neoliberalist establishment itself do not want that man in power in the same way that they are terrified and loathe Elon Musk. And for me, that's how alliances must be formed on the on that old adage, my enemy's enemy I- is my friend. No, I, I was 0 for 3 on my pardon uh, attempts at the end of the administration. I, I publicly wanted Assange, Snowden, and Ulbricht. Ulbricht was the guy who started Silk Road, and they had the book thrown at him. So huh. I'm there with you, with Russell. So I I, I failed on when I was trying to, to get uh, at least clemency or at least a dropping of charges uh, for all three of those. Okay, so, I mean, firstly, for one... Good on you, Russell, for sticking to your guns, or at least asserting that you do, in fact, believe any of the things you say. Credit where credit is due and all that. Saying like, hey, in, in, my, in my efforts to be, you know, congenial and all that, I, I've, I've often put aside the fact that, uh, that, yeah, Trump was the guy who, who, you know, went against Assange and all that, which, which I take issue with personally. Okay, good for you. But, um... But in terms of Charlie Kirk's response, Albrecht, that is a weird pull. Because mm-hmm. uh, like Assange a and Churchill Snowden, at the end, if you will, a, church, a Churchill at the end, yeah. right? And, and again, it sent me down another little rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> because I was like, "Huh, that's weird." Because uh, like Assange and Snowden, like whistleblowers, both problematic to me. But whatever, okay, I can understand the argument, you know, on a, on a basis of principle. Um, but but Albrecht, the guy who operated Silk Road. 
He was given double life imprisonment plus 40 years without the possibility of parole for his conviction in engaging in a continuing criminal enterprise, narcotics conspiracy, conspiracy to commit money laundering, and conspiracy to commit computer hacking. Basically, Silk Road was a dark website which which allowed people to anonymous, anonymously purchase narcotics, um, sometimes weapons, all manner of nefarious and illegal shit. Um, federal prosecutors alleged that Albrecht had also paid $730,000 in murder-for-hire deals targeting at least five people, and Albrecht was separately indicted in federal court in Maryland on a single murder-for-hire charge, alleging that he contracted um, someone to kill one of his employees, um, a former Silk Road moderator. Um, and then, so I was, like, I was like, this is, why the fuck is this happening? So uh, a couple of years ago, the likes of Congressman Thomas Massey and um, then Libertarian presidential candidate Joe Jorgensen uh, were arguing for the release of Ulbricht on the basis of his imprisonment being against free market principles and supposedly his sentence being a violation of the Eighth Amendment, which prevents cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And like fucking weird, fucking weird from start to finish. Yeah. And even weirder for Charlie Kirk to hop on board with the course. Yeah. I'm like, why? Just why? <laughs> really weird. Really weird. Oh, how strange. How completely strange. Yeah, okay. Um uh, yeah. Now in the next clip, uh we 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 pivot to the inevitable discussion on Christianity. But I know you and I, uh, I think, have uh, it deeply in common, as well as like, you should just see two books that are on the desk right now. This is Winston Churchill's Thoughts and Adventures. This is C.S. Lewis's there you go. Uh, The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis. So there are many areas in which we're uh, uh, clearly aligned. And and I, I know that you wanted to talk somewhat about uh, Christianity. And I sometimes wonder when, it, 10, 10, 20 years ago, when the Republicans were in the ascendancy, when the occupation and war that concerned most people was the the Iraq war, when the warmongering leaders had the name Cheney, but the first name Dick, when it was a Bush in the White House, when it was Halliburton Hilarious. rather than Pfizer that was the, sort of, the corporate it. entity that caused consternation. <laughs> the assumption was that Christianity was leveraged to legitimize American expansionism. And now it's a sort of an extraordinary kind of anti- Christianity that is used to, I don't know, as a kind of spearhead for nihilism, for materialism, for abandonment of all real values. So I just wonder where you think Christianity becomes significant when forming a political opinion and how that relates to fundamental principles like peace, non-interventionism, compassion, love, the simple rules of Christ, love thy neighbor as you love thyself, love God with yeah, all thy heart. Right. Pretty basic and profound principles. How do you think that those ideas uh, ought inform politics? I, I mean, I think it, it is the, the biggest ingredient that informs our politics. And, and Russell, I, I watch a fair amount of your stuff. I love your curiosity towards Christianity. I, I think it's I think it's awesome. And I don't want to speak for you or out of turn, but um, I'm, a, I'm a serious Christian and um, I, I believe it. It is the it is the way, the truth and the life. Happy to talk more about that. Oh, um, so I mean. Russell is not just curious about Christianity. He does Bible readings for his locals channel. He is an overt Christian zealot who believes secularism and atheism are the downfall of society and that we should all live in a Christian theocracy. That is the point he was tentatively driving at in his usual brambly sort of way. And Charlie Kirk, being a Christian evangelist, uh, is all on board. Um, Didn't and, Russell uh, say yeah. he wasn't going to like force very specific answers by couching his questions so ridiculously didn't he say that he was gonna not do that to charlie kirk okay yeah yeah he mm. um he says a lot of things doesn't he this mm. guy uh, <laughs> just um and, and observation yeah, but, blue sky thinking yeah and apparently there's 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 an anti-christian um situation occurring oh, in america uh, <laughs> news to me that's news yeah. to me yeah, I, 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 um, I struggled in in finding any evidence for that. Um, so you I think know, you're going to continue I'd, to struggle. You might be right. You might Aww. be right. Um, now, so what happens next is Charlie goes on a bit of a tirade, and so I'm going to take it chunk by chunk. Right here is the first bit. 
But from the, the political side, look, uh, the two things you mentioned, uh, you know, Jesus Christ, our Lord said that all the laws of the prophets are upon these two things, which is Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 6, 3 through 5, which is love your neighbor as yourself and then love the Lord your God with their heart, soul, strength, and mind. And so let's just take Leviticus 19, which by the way, is a, it's an amazing, uh, not very quoted or studied uh, piece of the scriptures. Uh, in that sure. very same chapter, by the way, is also that sure. you shall not favor a rich man or a poor man in a court of law. That is right there where we get the idea of Western blind justice, that you don't give the Wall Street banker a break just because he bankrupted our economy in 2008 because he works for Goldman Sachs. And th th so th that, that, uh, that's, that biblical principle we have forgotten in the last decade and a half. We have one set of rules for the oligarchy and another set of rules for the commoner. If that's your principle, then why aren't we allowed to prosecute Trump for his crimes? Oh, that's different? Oh, okay, that's different, is it? Um, so he has to bring up Leviticus here, uh, which is pretty well known as one of the more contentious Bible chapters, usually brought out for a good old bit of gay bashing by the Christian right. Um, now, there are various things in Leviticus I could trot out, which I know for a fact Charlie Kirk does not follow. Wearing clothes of two fibers is an obvious one. Eating shellfish, that kind of thing, you know. And, a lot of and home so, maintenance, kind of like, yeah. like a this old house Absolutely. Portion. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, there, there, there was a, there was a bit about um, uh, a guy if he, uh, if he rapes a female slave, then that's that's okay and doesn't require stoning to death because the the slave is owned and it's not property. married. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's a great book. Um, and and so yeah, this guy is is you know a little pixie choosy with the Bible, um, while also somehow making the case that it's the word of God and should all be followed. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, the specific portion from Leviticus 19 I would read back to Charlie Car uh, Char Charlie. Kirk um is this Charlie Kirk Charlie Kirk Charlie Kirk Charlie Kirk, Kirk. 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 um <laughs> uh, yeah the 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 quote I would uh, pick from Leviticus 19 is this one right when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall do him. Uh, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Love That's, immigrants, Charlie. That shit's everywhere. Love that shit's yeah. all over the Bible. Also, I mean, the Bible yeah. is also just chock full of contradictions. I do love the love thy neighbor. Kind mm. of like a uh, refrain from Christians mm. in general, but definitely from these fucking jokers is like, if you, it's an amazing loophole if you fucking hate the dog shit out of yourself. Like if you absolutely despise yourself. <laughs> That's true. Fucking love thy neighbor party as time. you love thyself. That's yeah. absolutely true. Um, Running yeah, that a lot yeah. in my life where it's like, oh, you think that you're like you, you're terrible to yourself. I'm going to stay out of your way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I think ultimately any any set of religious beliefs are only as good as the person who is following them um because you know because of this picking and choosing you know the the uh, I could I could pick some incredible delightful things from the bible and form a set of beliefs on that i could i could pick some people do it all the absolutely time hot they do and i could pick some absolutely horrifying shit and form a set of beliefs on that and 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 uh, you know th those would be two wildly different people yeah. um following somehow the same book um you know it's it's yeah i i think that applies to i mean they're all bopping around here with too many guns so it's going right. great yeah yeah, it's great. wonderful. Uh, so next, uh, he takes his love of Christianity to a bit of a dark place. But look, uh, we, we're entering this kind of era of new paganism in the West. This idea of atheism or not what? believing in anything um, is rubbish. Everybody believes in something. Everybody has gods. Everybody has something they worship or something they prioritize. Uh, in, in the, the new religion basically is some manifestation of pleasure first, the trans agenda, anti-racism. You could call it a hyper-environmental, earth-worshipping agenda. And I'm nothing against environmentalism, but when it gets to the point of where the, the worship of the earth is above humanity, I have some big moral problems with that. 
Okay. Uh, the short clip, lot packed into it. Um, he, he decried the trans agenda, anti-racism, and what he described as a hyper-environmental earth-worshipping agenda, saying that if the worship of the earth is put above humanity, he has some big moral problems with it. And Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. Saying dirty if, hippies is a lot more efficient. Isn't it? If there is no earth, there is no humanity, yeah. you stupid fuck. Yeah. Go back to college. Good God. Um, <laughs> anyway, he, he's he's not done with his bigotry about trans people, so buckle in. Here we go, everybody. And Christianity stands against these false gods. Uh, in Genesis 1 through 11, the order and separation that we have enjoyed in the West were detailed. The separation between man and woman, good and evil, holy and profane, man and nature. And that established order is necessary for human beings to flourish. In my personal opinion, the establishment is doing a very good job of destroying both that order and separation that we're living through. I believe there's a spiritual element to this. I believe it comes from the demonic, um, where they do not want you to have this, to the distinctions Demonic. of male and female recognizable anymore. The distinctions of good and evil recognizable anymore. The distinctions of nations anymore. And dare I say, if you do not have distinctions, then you have this very confusing oneness. And distinctions, I think, are what makes life exciting. In fact, isn't that what they're always telling us? Diversity is our strength. They don't believe in that. Uh, they, they do not believe in things that must be separate must be separate. Oh, good God. He um. <laughs> identified the unity within the, like, the effort towards unity. Like, he's, he's like, oh, this oneness, but oh, but it's bad. No, it's called intersectionalism. Like, it's it, it's an intersectional approach, which is both diverse yeah. and unified. If we yeah. were all on the same fucking page. Yeah, right. So, just I said mean, it. just... just <laughs> Just listen to this little white boy tying himself in knots over the audacity of people for wanting to be treated with respect. Um, you know, it's 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 not a confusing oneness we're after, Charlie. We don't want everybody to be the same. We want everybody to be who they are with the acknowledgement that both sexuality and gender exist on a spectrum um, and are not a binary system. Like if you're a cishet man, great. If you're a pansexual non-binary person like myself, great. All we want is to be treated with equal amount of respect and that is it that's the whole fucking game that's the whole thing oh dear and what one more thing to mention alongside this is that the narrative he's spinning of the left wanting a confusing oneness does again actually tie back into the great replacement theory of the white race being diluted by all these brown people coming in until we all look the same um that's it's it's a pushing of the exact same thing it has the same undertones uh, so that's great yeah it's great yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, Charlie has more to say because, of course, he does. Um, and he caps off his little uh, hate speech tirade with this. And so in Christianity, we believe that all of life points you towards a recognition that you are born a sinner, that you are not perfect, that you're far from perfect from the glory of God, and that God, God in the incarnation took human flesh and that we must accept Christ our Lord. Uh, and in that moment, you are born new and transformed permanently and um, eventually enter into eternal life. That ethic, that kind of normative Christian theology um, is what largely built the West, which I am a daily, uh, daily involved in trying to keep the West from uh, committing suicide. And I hope we can have a restoration of those values, those ethics and those principles, because um, I believe it is the truth. That's very, there's some things in there with it, which I strongly agree. Oh dear. Um, R R Russell had overall been doing quite well in terms of pushback in this interview, but but he, he listens to a hateful tirade from Charlie Kirk shitting on trans people, the concept of anti-racism and environmentalism, and all Russell has to say about it is, oh, there's some stuff in there with which I strongly agree. Uh, fuck me. He, he's made it clear he can push back when it's an issue he gives even the tiniest sliver of a shit about. But those three things? Like, I can't say he agrees with all of it, for sure, but he at the very least agrees with some of it and offers zero pushback. Well, my, my, my position is he doesn't. Like, he's, he's just, he's mining talking points. That mm -hmm. These are, these are, like, he's, uh, as far as what looks like pushback, 
it's yeah, the yeah. stuff that he's got like it's the talking points that he needs to manage yeah he's like do my yeah, work yeah. for me what's mm-hmm. <laughs> give me give me yeah. the mailing list <laughs> like yeah yes that. yeah yeah exactly right. um yeah the, the the part i know with certainty that russell agrees with is charlie kirk wanting to have a restoration of christian values ethics and principles within the west as he calls it which just means america um and in charlie kirk's conception of it it specifically means straight white uh, straight white male america which um coincidentally is where misogynist and let's return to traditional values guy russell brand is also going to land um so yeah definitely definitely with that and the the concept of the west committing suicide is is another um dog whistly great replacement um phrase by the way if you ever hear that that's that's generally what they're talking about is um is uh committing suicide by low birth rates among white people etc um delightful stuff uh so glad this man has so much influence it's it's really good well it's pathologizing uh, yeah you're mm. pathologizing in that instance mm. you can, mm. there's it's so convenient on like a number of levels Ugh. Ugh. Mm-hmm. Ugh. now in the next clip we, we we get a bit of a tech issue and 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 there have been a few throughout the interview um kind of there, there was a cursor on screen for a good chunk of time there that was that was amusing me um but but for for some inexplicable reason the camera lingers on a solo shot of just charlie kirk while russell goes on a bramble here and 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 for lauren and viewers just watch how uncomfortable he is with what's happening and i wonder sometimes about how ideas like you know render unto God, what is God's, and unto Caesar, what is Caesar's, are utilized to facilitate the kind of aspects of imperialism, <laughs> Charlie, which are not great. You know, like Western civilization, many of its philosophies, its art, the Renaissance, there are so many things that are incredibly beautiful, uh, certainly uh, in theory, but there is no question it's that. Squirming. It, Ha- has led us here uh, and i feel be here, that, Russell, that is not you. because of its inclusion of christian values but because <laughs> it has disavowed them legitimized them metastasized them, and metabolized them <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, in order to it. create false idols which uh, like you know were evident in the 1980s the 1970s the 1960s and they're yet more evident now in fact i would see us as being on a kind of continuum rather than you know the last 10 years representing a particular aberration uh, so like, that's one thing that uh, I feel you know we could uh, address if we had time. But I'd love to. I know that you've got a show in a minute, mate. Uh, your your team has told us, and I, I'd love to just uh, sort of for a moment cover exactly what you feel uh, your what your personal connection to Christ is. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> that was so bad shit. Like what Yeah. So we so ended profoundly. there? That's yes. where you were going? That's that's where we, that's where we're gonna land. Um and 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 yeah, there, there's only a couple more clips of this, but yeah. Uh <laughs> that that was such a profoundly awkward <laughs> awkward clip and for some reason an audio clip from the very start of the interview was played in the middle of russell speaking just delightful i I love it um anyway russell's little jag there about false idols is actually all he was saying he was confirming and affirming charlie kirk's position that we as a society are worshiping things like the transgender anti-racism and hyper environmentalism and that is a problem russell agrees with that and goes a step further to say hey this has been a problem for a while actually in various forms you know going back to the 60s and we need to address it um mm, very interesting very interesting yeah i don't want to watch charlie kirk squirm like that that was it was i I do enjoy a good like watching someone mentally figure out like watching someone's face and they're trying to figure out when to like hop in the double dutch you know like hop Mm -hmm. in the jump ropes and then like Mm. and then like nope no i don't get to like and just kind of be like (laughs) i'm gonna wait there yep, is not yep. this but that was crazy to land on <laughs> yeah that that's um well we kind of breeze past everything so let's talk about your personal connection to christ oh, okay um so yeah sadly before we can before we can delve much further into into the concept of what the problem has been since the 60s or whatever these two run out of time and so yeah the final question posed to charlie kirk is based on his uh, his personal connection to christ 
oh, I mean, I'm, I'm nothing without Jesus. Uh, I'm, I'm a sinner. I fall incredibly short of the glory of God. We all do. I gave my life to the Lord in fifth grade and it's the most important decision I've ever made. And everything I do incorporates Jesus Christ. He is the living God. And I know for some people it might sound goofy or wacky, but what makes Christianity different, and I respect all different views, but Christianity is not like all other religions. As I mentioned, it's the idea of the divine and the logos becoming flesh. And in John three, Jesus says, you must go through another birth. He's talking to Nicodemus at this time that you must be born again. So when you accept Christ, the Greek word is metamorphosis, basically, you completely change. And I could tell you, Russell, even if I'm having a bad day, I still have the joy of Christ. Even if I'm having, you know, a difficult time, I'm born new. And, you know, the scriptures tell us that this is the greatest love story ever. Because the only explanation for why the eternal would come down to the temporal, to the broken, to the flawed, and to the dirty is out of love. And the, I don't, the, the word love in English is incomplete. The Greeks had many words for love. Uh, for example, phileo, brotherly love, oh eros, gosh. romantic love, storge, love between um, a, a, a mother and a child or a father and a child. But the word love for Christ in John 3.16 is that agape. It is sacrificial love. It is the love of one that would die for you. And so Christ our Lord came down, lived a perfect life, died a brutal death, defeated death on the cross and in the grave to live against so that we might have life eternal. And I have a joy that doesn't, doesn't get muted, that keeps me going. It is my why. And I hope I can bring that light to as many people as possible. And it, it is, it is the, the most important component of my existence. And I'm blown away just to be able to say that God loved me enough to send himself, his son, to die for us so that I might live. Who? So the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the whole, you know, talking about the Greek kind of, uh, the, the Greek different words for love, you know, that I, I distinctly remember having that conversation while I was still in high school. Um, and, and that's that, I feel like that's the level of conversation that we're, <laughs> Oh, oh, I remember again. the week that our <laughs> our Southern Baptist pastor found uh, Greek translations for love. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, it was you, just you as know. fucking useless and insufferable then as it is now. I'm so bored. Uh, you know what? It was interesting yeah. the first time I was probably 12, and I was like, "Huh, etymology's right. neat," and yes, that's yes. <laughs> what I thought. Yeah. See, I, I, I was now I'm I was bored it, to. Um, death with this I, I was, stupid I, I, shit i was given it by a friend who at the time was really into the philosophies and works of eric from um you know who, who was uh, one of the um yeah, well, one of the cultural Marxist people, actually, um, as in, not, not as in not the not the bad ones, but you know, he's he's one of the one of the good philosophers that was there trying to do stuff. Um, yeah, and a, bu a buddy of mine just uh, got really into that and was like, "Whoa, look at all these different things," you know. And it's okay, fine. Um, when, when, Words when are you, neat. When you, yeah, when you're 16 or 17 or whatever, great, cool, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, 30 year old man rattling yourself, and there are there are a number of things to take away from that clip. But one of the most revealing to me is that apparently the most important decision Charlie Kirk ever made was when he was around 11 years old. Mm -hmm. um, except children don't really have agency like that. That decision wasn't made by him, even if he thinks it was, um, you know, that, that, that decision was made by, you know, he was guided down that path by his family, by his community. And that's kind of all that's ever happened to this man, to be honest. I'd, I would be very genuinely shocked if Charlie Kirk was capable of independent thought at this point, to be perfectly honest. Like, I haven't heard or seen him come up with even a single cogent thought that can't be traced back to nodding along with the shit the people around him are saying. That's why he said break stuff instead of move fast break. I'm telling you, is because yeah. he's not <laughs> exposed to the actual culture. He gets this like weird bits and pieces that he has to just like regurgitate and listen, I won a number of silly little prizes memorizing scripture when I was a child. Like, mm. I love the, that little, the little weird, like, uh, monster finger puppets we used to get that were kind of like clear plastic. Oh, yeah. Tight, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Yes. Scripture's got me those. Cash that shit in. Fine. You're a Dope, grown up. Yeah. 
sir, yep. you're grown. Like, let's let's have a <laughs> yeah, let's have Apparently. thoughts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, right. He was born in 1993. Um, oh dear. Uh, yeah. Also, also, um, I, I remember I don't 1993. Think... That I'm gross. <laughs> I don't like that. I, uh, I I don't think it counts as death if you come back to life, but maybe, maybe that's just me being nitpicky about stakes are low. religion. And, uh, yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of. Um, and 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 I mean the whole concept of being being both a father and a son. Well, I don't, yeah. Anyway, he's, anyway. He's, well, his whole his whole thing about like oh this love of Jesus and I feel have such a great day. Would you feel the same? Let's try it. If you didn't have <laughs> boatloads of fucking money, Charles. Mm. It might be a little harder. Mm. You might have more of a hard time. And not to say that yeah. that's for everybody, but I'm saying to Charlie Kirk, I think you might be challenged. We yeah, try. you might you might find it a little bit harder to see the light on a daily basis. Um, yeah. if 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 your daily basis is drudgery and poverty, um, you know, maybe it's a little bit harder. Yeah. Um. Now we get one final clip here, and. Uh, <laughs> Russell decides to close the show with a Bible reading. Let's go with, out on John uh, 3, starting from 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it whence it came and whither it goeth so is everyone that is born of the spirit then over the page 16 as, as verse 16 that you cited for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life charlie that's a great way for us to wrap up our conversation it was good for us to focus on the many areas that we agree and find new ways that we might form new confederacies to oppose this neoliberal <laughs> establishment power that tyrannizes us all would love to have covered that some of that demonic stuff you touched upon but surely we will speak again and meet again charlie thank you for your support and uh thank god you bless. for this conversation god bless you too man thank you Oh, we can only pray that Charlie Kirk comes back to talk about demons. You know, that that at least would be fun for me, you know? <laughs> like, oh, this is this is fantasy land. Well, Let's we have to remember Let's we're it. talking about demons and we're talking oh. about like there's two there's mm. two other dog whistles that we need to listen for, dear listener, right? One, qualify like basically categorizing atheism and any kind of or nuns, right, as oh, it's all that's just another religion. Um, is an insult to your intelligence mm. and is just is is yep. putting any um, discussion about uh, social imperatives or or like any kind of just like discussion about how society like like the benefits of separating the church and state all that kind of stuff or like why people are atheists validating that belief structure um, you know like validating that like that's calling saying that it's just another religion um and not just atheism any number of things right like mm. it, it's not a religion is a specific thing religion yes. is a thing yep. and then things that aren't religion aren't religion right that and mm -hmm. <sighs> i forgot the other one anyway. that's cool that's cool there yeah, were two that were gonna fit together <laughs> let me see if we we'll have see it. if it comes back we'll see if it comes yeah back. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah 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 well, also it, it appears neither of them are aware that charlie kirk is actually a key component of that neoliberal establishment power that tyrannizes us all yeah. um but hey i can't go expecting these two anti-intellectualist crusaders to be literate and understand words now can i mm. and just a final thought on that. Neither of these two men went through higher education of any sort, so like beyond the age of 18, right? And I was trying to think of the main thing that I personally learned from both my creative musicianship degree and the bit of a law degree that I did. And what it came down to was critical thinking skills, I think. Mm -hmm. um, now, these are absolutely things that you can develop outside of higher education, uh, but I do think it's a lot harder without instruction and without someone pushing you towards critical analysis and how 
how to critically analyze something in as objective a way as possible. And really, it's that skill, critical thinking, that both of these men lack in earnest. Um, yeah. Every single one of the ideas they put forth goes more or less unexamined and certainly is not examined critically. Um, they've picked them up from people they respect and like, uh, in Russell's case, Gareth, and uh, in Charlie Kirk's case, the Republicans around him, and they don't even for a second examine any of these views before just spreading them out into the world as the literal gospel truth. It's a lot of rote memorization mm. masquerading as intelligent thought, truly. And not to say that, listen, we can learn a lot from other people, and and especially like in my experience and in my life, um, referencing other people's uh, learning and understanding is the best way to go. Mm. That's not rote memorization. Learning is no. not repeating. And that's what's being rewarded. The other thing I was going to think of that I was thinking of is like uh, the other dog whistle was the demons thing, which you're saying about mm. demons, right? Right. Is, yeah, yeah. Um, that is a talking point that is invoked by like Christian fundamentalists as even if um, you are a person in the world who may or may not believe in God um, and is expressing views they disagree with. Um, they don't have to listen to you because you could just be possessed by a demon. A demon could be making you say it. So they have found myriad ways to take your agency from you. Um, even if you are standing up and trying to do anything about it, trying to like buck the status quo of any kind. Um, they have so many different ways to not listen to you. And the mm. demon thing is like, it's such, it's a, it's fucking insidious. Cause even if, cause then they can act and that's how they see love thy neighbor, right? Is like, mm. oh, well, I love you and I care about you, which is why I don't want you to be gay. Um, like you can be gay, but you can't like act gay. Uh, yeah, I love yeah, you, the, or like or I don't. May, maybe, maybe the gay bit is just actually you've got a demon inside you, and we need to send or you that. to a camp. We need or to that. send you to a camp and that have an illegal. exorcism, and yeah, in a lot of states in this country. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And and with, with that, with that, you know, oh, no, it's, it's it's a demon. You can you can write off anyone or anything, pretty much. You know, you <laughs> just just anything that's inconvenient at all. Yeah. Um, absolutely. It's a get out of jail free card that they can just throw down any yeah. old time. Yeah. It's amazing. Hundred percent. Amazing. Hundred percent. Anyway, yeah, that was uh, that was Charlie Kirk. <laughs> Woo. Woo. Nobody said um, anything. Nobody said yeah, anything. I just... Kind of. Yeah, it was It was both incredibly hateful and incredibly uninteresting in a lot of ways. <laughs> Empty calories. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this guy is one of the most popular communicators in the world, somehow. Money. Funding. Yeah. How is he gets a lot of money? <laughs> I does again, get a lot of money. like yeah money um and uh, telling people what they want to hear mm, yeah yeah and and parroting uh parroting right wing talking and really honestly just m moving that overton window as far as he can over to the fucking right and yeah it, it kills me that this guy is only 30 years old that's that's what that's what i keep having to come back to i'm like this guy is already this dangerous yeah know, but and, there are a mm. number of like of of religious programs and uh institutions in this country that have been especially like training grounds with their express mm. purposes to make charlie kirks yeah um yeah. so yeah. I, again like in that environment i don't think that the the university the college he would go to isn't going to change what he's like is isn't going to encourage uh, critical thinking in any way that like this the pipeline includes college if you so choose i don't think he needed that extra training i think he had his he got his trail training wheels off early because he had the agenda down pat. yeah yeah he, he had the indoctrination he uh, yeah he had the indoctrination all all already down he was yeah. already uh, good 
I, I don't think a college experience would undo that for Charlie. Um, you know, but, but he's, you know, there, there, there's, uh, there's too far gone. Um, I, I do think he needs to go back to college to learn, to actually learn things. Uh, but, and then but he that's might the have, thing. We made know. enough colleges in this country that that mm. will not guarantee a fucking thing. And, and. Oh yeah. He'd, he'd just end up going to fucking Larry Arne's college. You know, he, right. he'd end up going there and learning the alternate history of Winston Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> like, well that's the thing is is and at the beginning of the episode you know we and what we have talked about i've talked about until i'm blue in the fucking face and we talked about um you know on the main show and on off brand is about like just the uh assault on like the decades long assault on the education system and mm -hmm. he's integral yes. to that fight and yeah. he has been for a long time um yeah that's so your little acts of resistance listeners if you so choose is to either listen to sold a story there's a series I believe npr or uh pri has put out and that's why reading levels are so bad in america right now it's terrifying and uh 1619 project is free everywhere absolutely you can absolutely. you can watch it you can listen to it you know pat it bop it whatever you can find it that's yeah, and that can be your little act of resistance it's around it's in podcast easy. form. It's um, great. You know, it's yeah, yeah. Go to the website. There's a, a neat little, you know, lots of reading. There's and, tons and of resources, infographics, too. and so yeah. so much, so much good stuff. And and that um, that actively fights the fight against uh, people like Charlie Kirk and you know the fucking 1776 Commission and all of that bullshit. Crazy. Um, all right, everybody. Um, hopefully let next week will be less of a horror show. I can't imagine it somehow getting worse, but I guess I'm not going to hold my breath. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, if you want to support us in what we do, head to patreon.com slash on brand. We would love to have you. Um, and you can, yeah, you can check out the cool little uh, behind the scenes off brand that we did um, this last week. And uh, if you want to get in touch, uh, drop us an email. It's the on brand part at gmail.com. Um, we will get back to you at some point. Uh, if you're on Facebook, there's a Facebook group, On Brand Awakening Wonders. Um, constantly having fun discussions in there. Uh, if you prefer more anonymous communities, then uh, there's a subreddit. Um, it's uh, r slash on brand underscore pod. Um, some lovely human beings over there too. Dare I say, possibly the only nice place on Reddit as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> um uh I, there might be others but um but yeah that that little community is is very pleasant um socials uh, we're the on brand part at most places except for where we're not uh look for the logo everybody the um, blue logo that should be yeah. oh yeah my, my blue logo is not there that's uh, okay <laughs> the, the, look for the logo in any case um and and uh, and and you'll find us um and uh yeah in terms of uh, personal socials i'm at alworth official and lauren is at made.by.lauren.b um, in most places yes and speaking of that instagram that is made.by.lauren.b mm. and mm. oh if i really get my shit together maybe even on the other social media places that i haven't posted very much in a number of years that i should be <laughs> <laughs> uh because this sunday march 24th i'm going to have my shop stocked and have a full like actual line of things that you don't just have to be in chicago in three specific stores <laughs> to get to like right cool. here i've got blanks that are getting ready to be carved into new things Ooh. um haha -ha, this is how we start is in a scrap of mdf and so um nice. that's gonna be this coming sunday and there's gonna be a lot of new cool shit so uh from magnets to shrinery everything in between i've been making smaller stuff so you don't just have to get a bigger thing um great for renters and for people that have apartments i'm not trying mm. to cost you your deposit so uh that is um uh, actually in my instagram if you're on instagram it's the easiest way to see all the updates. I've been posting shit to, for previews of what will be available. And I would love to see you there if that's if you're so inclined. Yeah, Get come on over and have thing. a look. And um, if you if you want a magnet, then uh, click the link in the description. It, yeah. It's got actual gold on it, everybody. Um, and then you can also gold. have a little look around Lauren's gold. shop. Ah, oh, there gold. it is. There's gold. actual gold. real live gold. gold. Oh, it's so bright today. Yes. So bright real today, gold. They're, We're they're brave. Real, we, se we send gold. gold. Hell yeah. Um, and yeah, take a little nosy around Lauren's shop while you're there. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, all right, uh, patrons, we will see you uh, Sunday uh, for some off-brand goods times. Um, and the rest of you will see you next week. We love you very much. Thank you for sticking with us. Bye. Bye. Love you. Bye. That's not win-win-win. That's lie, 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 lie. That's propaganda, propaganda.